welcome to the April 23rd Select Board meeting. This meeting is called to order at 6.30. And we have had two extremely long meetings in a row, the most recent of which was a mere five days ago. I am not expecting this meeting to be like that one, so uh, we shall see. Um, this is our last meeting here at Town Hall until the conclusion of town meeting, whenever that might be. Um, so when folks see us next, we will be uh, in whatever that room is called at the middle school behind the auditorium. Um, our first item is public comment, but there does not appear to be anyone here for public comment. So we will get through some untimed items before we get to our 645 item. Um, and we might as well start with the uh, uh, CHD uh, proclamation of flag raising. This is for child abuse uh, prevention awareness and the uh, children's memorial flag on the town common. Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? Sure. Okay, I move that the select board approve, well, which we'll start with the first one, I guess, the uh, proclamation. Sure. Do you want to, okay. I move that the select board proclaim April 2012 as Child Abuse Prevention Month. Second. Further discussion. I'll just note that this is something that we've done annually for a very long time, and as part of this, there will be a flag raising ceremony, which we'll get to in a moment, uh, on the town common on Wednesday. So, uh, further discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board approve the that the children's memorial flag be raised on the town common on april 25th 2012. second further discussion all in favor say aye aye aye, aye. that's unanimous um typically uh, when folks come in for these things we read the proclamations there's nobody here for this this time but uh, we could read the proclamation or not at the select board's uh, preference Would you like to read that, Ms. Stein? Sure, if I can find it, I will read it. Um, just give me a second here. Here we go. It's very short. Um, well, that's I, I would. Mr. Hayden oh, has yeah. it. Um, oh, yeah, there you go. Would you like to read it? <laughs> Otherwise, no, no, I will. All right. <laughs> Proclamation. Whereas April was first declared Child Abuse Prevention Month by Presidential Proclamation mm. in 1985 and whereas organizations dedicated to protecting children have used the special time of year to acknowledge the importance of families and communities working together to prevent child abuse, and whereas the month of April is devoted to celebrating all the activities to transform communities into places that care about families and children, and whereas Child Abuse Proclamation Month is about connecting all of those concepts so that solutions to child abuse may be achieved. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the select board of the town of Amherst declare April of 2012 to be Child Abuse Prevention Month in the town of Amherst and directs that the Children's Memorial be flag be raised at the town common on April 25th, 2012. Thank you. So we will sign that proclamation after the meeting. Okay, okay, note the um, date was wrong. It was wrong? Which part? On the last part that I read on April 25th, 2012. It's above. Oh, it, says, it should be 2012 instead of 2011. Thank you. <laughs> I always notice that as I read it. That's I excellent. don't know why. We appreciate <clears throat> that. Okay, sticking with that backside of the motion sheet, we'll get through a couple of other untimed items. We have a taxi license. Okay. I move that the select board approve the application of Dwight Thomas to set for a license to drive taxi slash chauffeur on behalf of green transportation. Second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Mm -hmm. And special liquor license. I move that the select board approve the application for a wine and malt special license for Brenda Ryan Newton director of catering on behalf of the University of Massachusetts for a reception to be held at Memorial Hall April 26, 2012 from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Second. Further discussion. 
All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. And we might as well do the committee appointments. Okay. I move that the select board appoint Andrea Battle to the Housing and Sheltering Committee for a two-year term effective on April 24th, 2012 through June 30th, 2014. Second. Further discussion. Uh, Ms. Brewer or Ms. Stein, would you like to speak about these appointments at all? I think Ms. Brewer should. Well, actually, if we wanted to, I don't know how, the order we want to do this in, I was just looking to double check if we'd gotten the charge on the table tonight. It is in the online packet, and I did just want to mention a little bit more about the charge, but we could certainly finish reading the name since we've already started, and I will bring up the charge again. Okay. So, um, did, yeah. I'll just note that these are apparently staggered. The, yes. You staggered the terms on purpose so that this yes. is a brand new committee. We're populating it for the very first time. So in order to um, have appropriately rotating seats, um, the the recommendation is to stagger them as stated. So, all right, for the discussion on Ms. Battle. And all in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Shall I continue? Sure. I move that the select board appoint Michael Giles to the <clears throat> Housing and Sheltering Committee for a one-year term effective April 24th, 2012 through June 30th, 2013. Second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board appoint Nancy Craig to the Housing and Sheltering <clears throat> Committee for a one-year term effective April 24th, 2012 through June 30th, 2013. Second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board appoint John Hornick to the Housing and Sheltering Committee for a two-year term effective April 24th, 2012 through June 30th, 2014. Second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. <coughs> I'm, I move that the select board appoint Denise LeDuc to the Housing and Sheltering Committee for a three-year term effective April 24th, 2012 through June 30th, 2015. Second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Would you like to speak about the charge yes, now? Yes, now if I might. I know we did this in kind of a funny order, but um, I just want to remind people what the composition of the Housing and Sheltering Committee was that we all decided upon last fall, and it is now up on the town website. There, the information on the Housing Partnership Fair Housing Committee and the Committee on Homelessness is still maintained on the website, so that information's not gone, so any studies or minutes, et cetera, is all there. But the Housing and Sheltering Committee now has its own web page. It is to consist of seven members. You'll note we appointed five this evening. Seven members representing a diversity of experience and range of professional expertise, including but not limited to housing production and management, familiarity with state and federal grant programs, strong record of collaborative work on behalf of the community or nonprofit organizations, social service provision, and past personal experience being homeless. In terms of the people that we have appointed so far, we, the two of these people, Michael Giles and Nancy Gregg, served respectively on the Committee on Homelessness and the Housing Partnership Fair Housing Committee. So we have one each from those previous committees. You will also notice those are the shortest terms because, again, that's that changeover from the old to the new. And we wanted to make it clear that it was not a reiteration of what we were doing before, but that we very much respect their work as well as others who did apply for this committee. Others did apply that were served on both of those committees in the past. The others are all names that are fairly new to all of us, except perhaps for Denise LaDuke, who is new to us for another reason, which is that she is the new director of the Amherst Housing Authority. One thing that many people have noticed over the years is that the, although the Amherst Housing Authority has its own elected board, there has not always been much of a connection between what the rest of the town committee structure understands of what they're doing and how the Amherst Housing Authority properties feed in with other Section 8 properties and everything else. So it was, I thought it was very kind of Ms. LaDuc to say, hey, I'm the new director and I'll take on some more work by being on this committee. So that seems like a really great way to facilitate. The two things that we're still looking for in particular um, associated with this committee, and again, we have had other applicants, but looking at the composition, we are looking hard for um, a person who has 
formerly experienced homelessness but feels able now to commit to a series of meetings and being able to be a committee member and also someone who has more experience in the housing production area whether it be a real estate person or a large property owner or somebody of that nature hopefully Amherst based to help <coughs> round out the skills and experiences that are available on this committee in terms of the committee I'm sure that Nate Malloy will be the one who is there um, staff liaison and he and I, I will expect, uh, he'll probably end up contacting all these individuals to see when we can have a first meeting. And I at least will plan to be present at that meeting to talk to them again about their charge and what the select board's expectations were. Great. Thank you very much. And thanks to everyone who applied. It's, uh, it's wonderful to get this committee finally off the ground. It's taken us kind of a while to do this, but we have been wanting to, um, to really make sure we got a good applicant pool and be able to choose among folks. We wanna make a strong start to this because this is uh, a, a little bit of a different direction that, that we're taking this in. So, uh, so that's excellent to get it started. Thank you very much. Okay, a couple more minutes, Ms. Stein. I would like to complete the committee Please appointments do. if I may. I move that the select board appoint uh, Ryan Harb to the Agricultural Commission for a term to expire June 30th, 2015. Second. For the discussion. I will note that Mr. Harb is the gentleman who was in charge of the permaculture initiative at UMass and whose project was uh, commended by President Obama recently in the White House Challenge. And I wonder how many other committee members we have out there who have actually received commendation from the President of the United States. <laughs> and went to the White House. Absolutely, yes. That was a great I was so happy to see, <laughs> yeah, and so young. I was so happy to see that uh, application. It's really in. nice. All right, all in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, aye. that's unanimous. Okay, have we got anything else here that we can do as an untimed item? We have three minutes. Probably not. Let's see. Uh, so what we do then is we start at the end of the agenda and work backwards. Um, I will just note one thing from the chair's report that um, I had emailed to the select board, forwarded an email from the university that um, they sent out, the vice chancellor for student affairs and as well as the director of Greek affairs sent out an email to all students and to all parents who they have email addresses for about expectations for the end of the semester, kind of reminding folks about safe celebrations and um, uh, it, reminding them about the town bylaws, about the fact that the code of student conduct applies off campus and that it applies right up until graduation. So even if you're a senior and you're getting out of here in a couple weeks, you really don't wanna put your degree at risk um, by, by getting into any trouble now. Um, so Select Board already knew that because I forwarded that to us when we received it the other day. But uh, something interesting that I learned that I wanted to uh, let you know about also is that the new Student Government Association president was also going to be sending out an email to all students about year-end uh, activities and I thought that that was really a great way to be kind of growing this conversation about shared expectations and uh, and you know mutually respecting uh, this community so I thought that was really good news and uh, and I appreciated that and I wanted the select board in the town to know about that the new student government association president uh, just elected last month's name is uh, Akshay Kapoor and I have not met with him yet I, I usually meet the new SGA president either in the spring or in the early fall um, but, and I have not had a chance to contact Mr. Kapoor yet but uh, I commend him on uh, on that initiative so I think that's great all right, it is now 6.44, which is, as we like to say, the same as 6.45. So we will get to our 6.45 item, which is the Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods Initiative. So speaking about uh, end of season things, um, Mr. Musanti, why don't you uh, take this opportunity to, to introduce folks to the Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods Initiative, which is something we've been talking about for a while and has sort of been taking shape, and uh, this is a good time to really bring folks up to date. Sure, and what I'd like to do this in two parts. Uh, first, what I'd like to do is uh, put some faces with two names who are new to town of Amherst uh, uh, government. Uh, I'm really pleased to uh, uh, introduce uh, to you and uh, the public this evening, Rob Mora, our new building commissioner who started with us on April 9th and has hit the ground running. 
Uh, and John Thompson is also here, uh, newly appointed as our code enforcement officer. Uh, very, very pleased and excited uh, about uh, both of these uh, gentlemen and what they bring uh, in their experience uh, to the work. Uh, the building commissioner, uh, uh, life safety, building code, uh, zoning enforcement, uh, Rob's experience in Weston and elsewhere uh, we think make him well, well versed and well suited to the needs facing the community, uh, and our goals to be uh, as responsive as we can be, still be uh, clear in setting out expectations, uh, be timely, uh, and and have that clarity. Working with uh, property owners, business owners, uh, and those who are considering investing in the town of Amherst that they'll have uh, uh, good experience working with inspection services. Um, John Thompson is also here tonight. He comes to the code enforcement uh, position and thank you select board, thank you Amherst Town Meeting for supporting the funding for the uh, addition of that position. Uh, John has started up part time, will be ramping up to full time uh, by early summer. Uh, John brings 38 years of experience in the building uh, trades uh, to his work, and we think he'll be a very, and is uh, proving to be very practical uh, 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 code enforcement position for us, uh, well versed on the code issues, but also the combination of that and his private sector experience puts him in a nice position in terms of problem solving with, with various uh, uh, folks that we, we we come in contact with so they're both here if they want to say a few words or not come forward uh, uh, <laughs> to give the Thank board you. in this setting to have a chance to see them and meet them there was a nice reception for these folks a week or so ago but not the whole community obviously did not get to attend that so uh, we thought it'd be a good opportunity for you folks to be able to come in introduce yourself so the, uh, the greater general public will know who you are and, and who they might be dealing with so welcome And I just remembered I forgot to tell you to turn the mic on. <laughs> oh, jeez. Um. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was like, they gave me a job and I totally forgot. <laughs> God. It's last time that, that's why I don't come early. Yeah. That is why I don't come early. You're, you're free to introduce yourself again. <laughs> Just in case folks didn't hear you. So you are John Thompson. You're the building commissioner. I am Rob Mora. Mora. Oh. And to my she knows right, See, John that's why you had to introduce yourself. <laughs> we'll Sorry. make you wear name tags next time. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> Rob Mora. I'm Rob commissioner. Mora. <laughs> to my right, John Thompson. Thank you for having us here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming in. Mr. Thompson, is there anything you'd like to add to this? I'm excited to be in the position. I've met with uh, land, some landlord groups already, and uh, really hit the ground running here terrific thank you Ms. thank Brewer. you since i totally fouled this up guys i'm so sorry <laughs> maybe you could speak just a moment to like what how the public might expect to interact with you like what kinds of things you do versus what he does sure uh you know i i intend on being you know that point of communication to the developer the prospective uh, project that's coming down the line uh if there's uh, any question on process and and how we can help uh, guide uh, applicants through the permitting steps. Uh, that's where I hope to be uh, very useful. Um, it, you know, J John is, uh, uh, when he comes full force and, and full time, will be taking on the uh, inspections and the code enforcement uh, for our various programs through uh, the uh, periodic inspections, certificate of inspections, and what we're going to hear a little bit about tonight after this with the uh, Safe and Healthy uh, Neighborhoods Initiative. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. I apologize for confusing sure your names, that. which I have done since I day one. Now have. they're just implanted wrong in my head, and it's going to be wrong forever. I'll work on that. Ms. I'm lucky because before I had any idea who Rob Morrow was, I sat next to him at Judy's. <laughs> 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 and so I have a heads up, and it's probably the only time I'll ever remember anybody's name better than you. So <laughs> anyway, good know. to see you again. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. All right. In the second part, in the second part uh, uh, I wanted to touch very briefly on uh, our Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods Initiative. Uh, there is a handout in your packet with the, uh, the blue picture on the front. That is also on the, town, on the uh, Select Board Meeting Packet uh, webpage for tonight's meeting, April 23rd. Um, John and Rob are part of a much larger uh, group of Amherst uh, staff uh, that involves myself, uh, Dave Zomek, uh, Planning and Conservation uh, uh, Director, uh, Julie Fetterman, Health Director. Uh, we have Police and Fire Involvement, Inspection Services, uh, Public Works, uh, and that's just the town staff. Then out in the community we have a growing number of landlords and property managers who we're interacting with and also we've had uh, tremendous collaboration that is also growing with uh, uh, college officials in town in particular the University of Mass uh, external relations uh, Dean of Students uh, Chancellor and his uh, his uh, uh, top folks uh, UMass Police Department uh, that that nature um, this is a fancy title for something that's pretty basic. How do we strengthen the quality of life in all of our neighborhoods in town? Um, because while we, are, we have many wonderful neighborhoods, some of them are under uh, uh, some stress. Uh, um, quality of life issues, noise, litter, uh, occasional uh, problems with individual parcels, uh, particularly some of the rental properties, but certainly not most uh, issues with uh, uh, code issues and other things. Um, we're trying to bring together a broad-based group to uh, uh, try to make progress in, in addressing these issues, and there's four main areas we're looking at, uh, education and outreach, uh, building uh, uh, what I was describing a moment ago as collaborative partnerships, uh, enforcement and enforcement strategies are a component of, of this effort. And then as well as uh, looking short term and long term at what the town can do to improve our infrastructure uh, and the physical setting within some of these neighborhoods. So in education outreach, I mentioned uh, the collaboration with the town staff and with the university uh, part of that is messaging to uh, students and college age uh, residents uh, to town regarding our both campus and community standards of uh, conduct and uh, helping to educate and reinforce you know, that there are some consequences when those uh, standards aren't lived up to or town bylaws are, are broken. Uh, there's also been outreach by the police, by uh, some of our landlord and property managers. Uh, to uh, bring that message uh, to, uh, to the young people in this community. Uh, partnerships, uh, uh, campus and community coalition, the UMass Dean of Students, uh, various neighborhood groups in town, uh, the Greek community, uh, organizations at, at the university, uh, student government, as Ms. O'Keefe mentioned, uh, including a, an outreach effort by the new uh, student government president that she mentioned, um, campus police uh, and town police, town fire inspections. Um, on enforcement, we're looking at uh, working with the dean of students, with uh, uh, law enforcement on uh, uh, holding those few who uh, after being attempt to be counseled, still have problems uh, complying with noise and uh, uh, 
uh, nuisance house bylaws in particular or, or student code of conduct issues for both on or off campus uh, behavioral issues uh, that there'll be some enforcement and follow through and we're pleased with the burgeoning cooperation that's going on and particularly pleased with the uh, uh, more consistent and responsive effort on the part of the uh, UMass Dean of Students. Uh, very, very pleased with that effort. Um, um, in terms of uh, infrastructure, we're going to continue to look for ways to improve uh, public transportation. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, street lighting, uh, neighborhood beautifications, uh, sidewalk improvements in our attempts to make the town more walkable, pedestrian friendly. Uh, also looking to partner with student groups and others, uh, community groups on neighborhood cleanups and those types of things. So there's a lot going on. Um, it is broad based, it's not easy, uh, and it's a long term effort. And so our, our objective is to uh, uh, keep working at this, talk a lot about what we're trying to do, encourage people to join us. We'll be reaching out and reporting our progress as we go along. Thank you. Um, before I open it up to any questions from the select board, um, I just want to know how important it is for the town to really be coordinating its efforts in this way. So these were a lot of things that were happening sort of in silos, you know, that's always the term people use, silos, um, before. But this is really bringing that whole work team together to make sure that they're coordinating with information from public safety, public health, and uh, inspections, and to jointly work together to be a resource uh, both to the non-student community and the student community. And I think it's important to note, as one of the bullet points on here talks about uh, rental units and good structural and functional repair. Uh, just because students live in student rentals does not mean that they have to live in squalor. So it's really important to be getting the message to students that um, they are fully members of this community and they are entitled to exactly the same kinds of health and safety that any community members are. And it's very important for them to know that the town is a resource to them also in making sure that the places that they live are safe and up to code. and. Uh, and that uh, that they aren't being somehow ignored or overlooked by the town. So, uh, so I think that that will be really important to students and to their parents. And uh, it, it's a it's a great opportunity to be um, to really be out there for for the uh, non-student sort of regular members of our community as well as the student members. So, uh, thank you very much for for sure. putting this together. And I think it's really uh, important to give the community an overview like this so that they know this resource is available to them. Who would you say is the point person? If someone had a quality of life concern, who would they call first? Uh, they, can, they can always contact me or in the town manager's office. Uh, but I have Julie Fetterman, our health director, uh, is our primary point person, uh, bring, uh, bring together uh, all of the various town staff as well as this outreach in the landlord community. I mentioned the uh, a recent meeting that a couple of us attended on campus recently where we had all the, the institutional players there, but we also had a number of uh, uh, property managers and landlords there who very much want to uh, collaborate and be part of a ongoing dialogue to uh, promote best practices uh, within the uh, landlord community, and we welcome that. And we don't claim to have this all figured out, but it's going to take working together to do it. So Julie and others are working to try to bring that about. Thank you. Questions or comments from Slack Board? Ms. Brewer. A um, Couple of things. One is that I know UMass students sometimes feel picked on, and we always talk about the fact that it's a really tiny percentage of people who are causing issues. Um, but I know that Amherst College and Hampshire College students are not without flaw in some respects, especially Amherst College as regards to EMT runs. So are we, what kind of relationship do we have with those campuses, given that it's not so much a neighborhood issue with them, because very few students live off campus in both those cases, but just to be sort of consistent in our messaging with UMass students, Amherst College students, Hampshire College students. We have excellent uh, communication with both Hampshire and Amherst College uh, through the uh, uh, campus uh, public safety 
people primarily and then uh, other people in the administration as needed. Um, you're right, that doesn't get a lot of attention uh, in a town with three colleges and one of which is very large. Exactly. Um, but that interaction is very important because some of those issues uh, occur, occur with that student population as well. But I would just also underscore that the vast, vast majority of young people in this community are, are contributing positive members every day to the community. And the focus is not, uh, uh, the focus is on the relative few mm -hmm. uh, to try to reinforce what some expectations are. And that's true for the students at all three, uh, three campuses. Thank you. Ms. Brewer? Um, associated with what, what some might consider the more punitive side of things, but we consider the sort of last resort sort of things. Um, with sharing information between the town and the dean of students, I know that this has been a long time coming over many years in terms of discussion. I wonder if you could characterize what the current plan is associated with that. Are all arrests reported or is it citations? You know, what's the, just so people have a sense of how that um, works. We are having regular meetings, typically on Mondays, uh, with uh, campus uh, public safety and dean of students uh, representatives. Uh, there's a lot of information sharing, uh, really from the law enforcement side. Uh, the dean of students uh, does share some information, but without violating uh, privacy uh, rights that students have under law, and she is keenly aware of those. And so does not cross that line in the sharing of information. I would note also that um, the information doesn't just come from a public safety standpoint. Right. And in fact, the Dean of Students Office has really been emphasizing that they want to know about problems early. The, the mm -hmm. Dean of Students Office isn't in the business of, of suspending and expelling students. What right. they want to do is um, provide educational opportunities to change behavior. And so when off-campus behavior is a problem, they'll take referrals from anybody. What they can't do is take something like, you know, Puffer's Pond, whole bunch of kids causing problems or whatever. Right. That's too general. There's nothing, nothing for them to follow up on. But if they have the name of a student and the location that, that, that constitutes an incident, they will follow up on every one of those, whether it comes from a member of the community, whether it comes from a landlord. Uh, at the meeting that uh, Ms. Musanti was talking about earlier with the landlords and public safety and all these folks getting together, um, they were really emphasizing that they want to know early, especially, for example, from landlords. They don't want to wait until this the student is uh, really out of control and you know, you've been putting up with too much, too much, and now it's just kind of the end of the line. They want to know early when, they, when there could be an educational opportunity for some intervention to kind of change that behavior. Um, but they follow up on, on every single referral and, uh, and they take the appropriate action. Lots of it is educational, uh, but it will run the gamut all the way to suspensions and expulsions. I'm really excited to hear that. That's really great, rather than just, you know, when it gets to a certain point, a report goes and ding, you're out kind of thing. So that sounds great. And the other thing I wanted to just follow up on was what you mentioned earlier, Ms. O'Keefe, is that students are entitled to the same health and safety standards the rest of the community are. I know there's been some tension over the fact that if we do start reinforcing the four-person bylaw that people who are living five or six to a house will fear that they shouldn't bring anything up for fear that they're going to get evicted. So I, I guess I'm just stating that we're going to think that through as we are working on that because that, that was an unfortunate outcome of a situation on East Pleasant Street a couple of years ago. It was, there's no way to argue it wasn't an isolated enforcement issue. So we need to, in order to avoid that sort of thing happening and for people to not feel like, well, I better not complain because I know there's five people living here. Um, I'm assuming there will be some sort of discussion as to how to magically make that work for people so they can still report the bad, that there might be unfortunate things in their housing situation. I think it's important that the that the students know the laws when they rent. And so they are putting themselves at some at risk, at some risk if they know that they are renting beyond what the local bylaws are. At the same time, it is complaint-based. I mean, we're not right. kind of going around town looking right. for... But no student knows that, except for the fact that 
information's been being provided much more recently. I mean, in terms of like, you know, if they go rent from a private house, um, they don't realize that information. It's certainly not in their lease, so. There's all concerned. kinds of information that is going out to them, and so the, there's an off-campus student uh, mm -hmm. office as well as off-campus housing office on campus that is trying to make that kind That's of information that available. And for them. Like okay, Ms. Fetterman uh, attends the off-campus housing fair and stuff. There's Good. there's all kinds of information that's going to the students. Is is every bit of information reaching every student? Certainly not, but um, but certainly the efforts are out there are to out educate there. them and in multiple and, ways. Right, in and multiple the more ways. Coordinated we are with it, right. the more. Uh, the, the more sure we can be of them. That's really good to hear, because I wouldn't want someone to get caught out, you know, for that particular thing, when we're so good at reminding them about kegs, for example. So, thank you. Anything else on safe and healthy neighborhoods, Mr. Wald? This is on the same topic. <clears throat> As Mr. Hayden recalls from the work in the Comprehensive Planning Committee, I think it's after Ms. Brewer had left, this was a topic of conversation there, too. So <coughs> the code enforcer, Mr. Thompson's position, in some sense, grew out of that, because part of the logic was, why should we talk about that? affordable housing and student housing. So we appreciate your comments about everyone being entitled to live in safe and healthy conditions. Thank you. And uh, just as Ms. Brewer pointed out uh, so well, and as did Mr. Musanti earlier, about the small minority of students causing the problems, it's also the small minority of landlords. Yes. You know, we have vast amounts of rental property in town, vast amounts, and most of it is extremely well managed and, uh, and makes for, for excellent neighbors, uh, both as the prop from the ownership perspective as well as the the uh, rental perspective, um, but the ones that that cross that line are the ones that the town needs to deal with. Uh, so, we're working on it. Okay. Anything else from folks? Anything? Any other members of the Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods team would like to add to this? Yeah. All right. Thank you all for for coming in tonight. Thank you for your excellent efforts with this. And uh, this is a this is a really important thing for the town to be doing right now. It's very exciting that this is really taking shape and making progress. So thank you very much. All right. So next up, we're back to warrant articles. Is uh, Mr. Morin coming in tonight? We'll skip him. Maybe he'll come in after. Okay, so then we'll start with Article 11, which is the regional school <coughs> assessment method, and then the two uh, school budgets. And we have Mr. Detweiler and Ms. Garrick from the schools here to talk to us about this. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. And uh, so here we are. We're taking positions on Warren articles again, and we are just briefly explaining them um, where briefness is possible. And uh, so I'll just note that um, Article 11, the Regional School District Assessment Method, we won't make these poor folks go through every detail of this again. We all know this. It's on the uh, warrant every single time. This is um, because the uh, the towns in our region choose to do something different than the state mandated ass assessment method. We will go with a five year rolling average of the student populations from the towns in the region. Every town in the region needs to vote to accept this method. So it's really a technicality that every town has to do so that we don't fall back to the state's required method. Is there anything else we need to say about this? That says it all. Okay. <laughs> You'll be taking it's, this It's an annual ritual. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's an annual ritual, and uh, we're just, we gotta start putting this stuff on the consent calendar or something. Yes. <laughs> okay, um, Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion on article? Sure. Or? I move that the select board recommend to the April 30th, 2012 annual town meeting, Article 11, Amherst Pelham Regional School District Assessment Method. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 <clears throat> That's unanimous. And Ms. Brewer typically does our school-related things. Do you want to do that one? Mm. Sure. I don't you think you have to explain you it. Earlier. <laughs> <laughs> she has about 15 in a row. Yeah. <laughs> That's oh. right. You don't have to do it. But well, I've got the rest right before it, so right after it, so I may as well. Okay. Moving along, then the budgets, which are much more interesting than the assessment method. <laughs> yes. So ever so much. More. What's your pleasure? Whichever one you prefer to start with. <laughs> Sure. Just came up first. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'd, I'd like to just speak to, if I could, for Please. one minute, um, a little bit of both, and then Rob can share some information, which I know you all have. Um, but I wanted to, first of all, just say that, again, this year, I believe that there was a, a very strong collaborative approach to budgeting from all of the town departments and the budget coordinating group, I think, was a highly effective um, 
meeting for us to be able to get together and really talk about our priorities. And um, I think everyone really worked together well to come up with um, responsible budgets. So I want to you know, thank people for the partnership again this year from the school's perspective. And again, from not only Amherst, but also from the four towns. And we had some, um, I think, very important four town meetings this year that we were able to kind of wade through some difficult budget um, situations for the different towns, which, you know, there's always, it always varies the perspective. But um, in terms of the schools, Amherst and the regional schools, we were able to this year really focus on our mission of our schools and to create a three to five year plan. I know many of you have heard some of these pieces before through the various venues. Um, we really focused on going deeper with our reform efforts and not adding new things to our budget. Um, we wanted to make sure that things were actually making a difference in our schools. Um, our priorities were um, and are related to aligning and strengthening our curriculum and instruction, um, a tiered instructional model to address the needs of students who are struggling, and to maintain what we consider to be an Amherst experience, what people would like to see happen in schools, a comprehensive um, offerings for our students, um, what people seem to and, and love to come to Amherst to um, have their children experience. So we worked to, to again, realize efficiencies um, as always, and to bring in additional revenue, as um, many people heard the discussions around school choice for Amherst this year. Um, and we also um, are looking actively at additional grant fundings, although we've had some of our funding stop this year, our ed grants, some federal funding. Um, and we're also leveraging partnerships um, with not only the town of Amherst, but also the uh, institutions of higher learning and the business community. And I think we've built a very uh, fiscally responsible budget, which I think our, our vision was to develop budgets that would be sustainable long term. And um, in terms of the region, we're, we were able to, as we discussed, reduce the assessment to the four towns um, based on some insurance numbers that came in um, to the better. And we're waiting anxiously to see what Chapter 70 comes in uh, to see if we're able to further reduce um, the assessments to the town, um, again, that's for the region and for Amherst, um, we were able to reduce, we had to reduce by I think $300,000, but we did not quite close that gap, which um, I know all of you are aware of. So in terms of um, the process, we feel like it was a very, um, as Sandy would say, it's a no drama year, and we were <laughs> strong and steady and have come through with, I think, a very responsible budget for Amherst and the region. I don't know if Rob, do you want to walk through any uh, numbers for people? I think I think people have seen the numbers over the months. So if you want to talk numbers, I'd be happy to talk numbers or just entertain any questions you may have left. Questions or comments from Select Board about the school budgets? Ms. Brewer. Tell us a little bit about the after school because we've already talked about that from the standpoint of community services and leisure services. Sure. Yeah. Be happy to. So um, about a year and a half ago, we started to look at our after school programs, which many people are aware have been either leisure services um, run programs or uh, private vendors or parent collaboratives. And we had varying programs across our three elementary schools. Middle school and high school, we have <coughs> one program, our own. Um, but elementary, the school has not had a hand in the after school programs. And it's been very much a private venture, although um, the use of our facilities and clearly our children um, stay after and we have shared responsibility. Uh, so we decided to um, begin conversations about a year and a half ago with the vendors to talk about how can we equalize um, the experience for our children across the schools, not that it has to be cookie cutter, the same exact program, but to really provide families with access to uh, waivers and vouchers for income eligible families, but also have a consistent um, rate for families in schools, I mean in the after school program, but also in also staffing and such and to be able to expand the enriching opportunities for children in these programs. So we um, began speaking with um, Mr. Musanti as well as other members from um, Leisure Services, Linda Shelfont, and we uh, moved toward having our after-school programs evaluated, which we did through the Wellesley, um, it's a national out-of-school time um, group, who came in and did a, a fabulous job of, of looking at all of the programs. And we have just put forward, um, Mr. Musanti and I, uh, a new model for after school programs, which would be a partnership between the schools and the town, which would be a comprehensive program, um, I think much modeled after the after school programs in Newton and some of the programs in the eastern part of the state, which would 
be a more sustainable model, um, allow the, the waivers and vouchers to be shared across the elementary schools and for the school to have a much stronger hand in financially as well as day-to-day um, -day in terms of programming um, within the after-school program. So the schools provide um, space and some resources for transportation as well as for academic interventions for students, um, professional development, and um, then the town is, would be the conduit through leisure services to um, manage the programs. So we're very excited by this um, new turn of events and we are going to be meeting shortly to hopefully take the next steps in terms of implementation. Right. Um, so we're, we're very pleased with, again, leveraging partnerships to be able to bring um, stronger programming to our students and to the community. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and if either Mr. Detweiler or Mr. Misanti would like to talk a little bit about the elementary school budget and because it feeds into our um, Article 22 part of free cash, we've talked a little bit about it here before, but um, now that we're in the formal budget uh, approval part, the, uh, the elementary school budget, as you said, couldn't be, couldn't be completely in balance within the uh, guidelines, uh, the, the finance committee guidelines that were put out based on revenue projections for next year um, because you have lost some stimulus money, as you said, the Ed Jobs money, and uh, as you referred to the um, school choice money for next year, which we can start doing in FY13, but we can't um, then use that money until the following year. So the proposal is to use some money from free cash to bridge that gap. Um, and that's how much money? About 218,000. 200. And 200. 200, there we go. <laughs> Don't forget exactly. that 200. <laughs> I, I would just add, uh, um, and I would encourage town meeting members to read closely the finance committee report to town meeting. It goes into some detail explaining the rationale uh, that the schools and the school committee have come up with that are, as you said, consistent with uh, the town's uh, guidelines about appropriate uses of our reserve funds, of which free cash is one. Uh, this is a one-time use from free cash uh, it's really a, a bridge year uh, to uh, keep the elementary school budget balanced. Uh, and then in subsequent years, there is a new recurring source of revenue that will be in hand at the time budgets are, are recommended and adopted uh, from school choice revenue. So this really gets us, uh, gets the elementary schools where they need to be in the coming year uh, while also adopting a best practice about how and when to allocate school choice monies. And so that was a, a formulation that I wholeheartedly endorsed and the Finance Committee I know has endorsed it uh, for town meeting. And we've been discussing that a budget coordinating group for uh, several months now and that was also endorsed right. by them. So the representatives from the school, town and library all recognizing that as a priority and being consistent with the reserve use as Mr. Musanti mentioned. Ms. Brewer and then Ms. Stein. I was just going to follow up since Mr. Musanti pointed that out so thoughtfully. Um, Article 22, it doesn't say it in there on page 55, town meeting members. Turn to page 10 of your finance committee <laughs> report and it's a little bit above the um, graph on that page. So just so that they don't think, oh, I don't see it. It's because it's back here and it has that very same explanation and it's very helpful. I, I would just add uh, on article 22, which is the free cash article, which traditionally at town meeting follows all of the other budget articles. Um, if the budgets that are recommended to town meeting are adopted as recommended, the FinCom would be prepared to uh, make a motion for $218,200 from free cash, uh, really would be for the uh, elementary school budget to support that. Um, they typically defer their recommend, the FinCom defers their recommendation to town meeting each year uh, as a just in case, in case there's any changes to, over the course of town meeting. But you could anticipate that motion if, if the budgets are voted as recommended. Thank you. Ms. Stein. Yeah. Um, I have a question, but it's about the regional budget. It would be appropriate to ask that now. We Certainly. were sort of dealing with both things together. I was looking at health insurance for employees and noting that there's a 50% in 15% increase this year. 
And I was wondering if that's because the teachers or the employees rather are on a different health plan. That seems steep no. to me. It's a great question. Um, you may remember the dialogue over the last couple of years uh, when it comes to central office staff and a central office costs being properly allocated to the three districts and so forth. And so we've, we undertook a study last year to determine whether that was the case or not and what basis do you allocate costs on. And we fell back finally on the, a, close to a per pupil rolling average basis, which seemed to be what was done originally. Nobody can remember how we got to the 50, 47, 3. Um, but when we did it uh, last year in a couple different ways, it came out pretty close to um, being, I think, 4% for Pelham, uh, 46 for Amherst, and region goes up to 54, some, something like that. So. What's happening is that there are central office costs being shifted from Amherst budget to regional budget. So as long as we were doing that, we also looked at how we allocate uh, health insurance costs. And the way health insurance costs have been allocated historically is whichever district you work in the most is where you got your health insurance from. And we decided, well, that's silly. Um, we really should be allocating it on whatever percentage you work in each district. Right? It's a little more work, but it's more accurate. Uh, and so these numbers reflect those two changes in how we allocate costs. Yep. But you don't expect them to go up at that rate in the future. This is no, just that's an a one-time shift type. from one yeah. district okay. to the other to, alloc to reflect where people are working. Uh, it's, it's not a change in rates. Good. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments on the elementary or regional school budget? Ms. Brewer? I just want to thank you for making those adjustments because every time we do something like that, it's just so much easier to explain to people mm -hmm. than to say, well, it's like this, well, but except for this little piece. So right. thank you. You're welcome. Anything else on the school budgets? Um, I would just like to uh, second what Ms. Garrick said earlier about how well the process worked, and I think that's true at Budget Coordinating Group as well as the Capital Planning through JCPC. Um, we are really so blessed to be so coordinated in this town with these different budgets. Um, one of the things I like to do, keeps me going, is read about the uh, dysfunctions and dramas in other towns. <laughs> and, uh, and honestly, in some towns, the, the, the town hall and the school department have no idea what's going on with each other. And that leads to all kinds of communication problems. It leads to all out fights. And it leads to really some very messy, you know, accounting issues and everything. So. Um, uh, in Amherst, we have a long history of working really well together, and I think that every town meeting is just proof of how well our system works and really how collaborative all the different partners are in it, and it's a, it's a good process, and we should be proud of it. So thank you all for being part of it. Okay, Ms. Stein, would you like to make a motion? Sure. I move that the select board recommend to the April 30th, 2012 annual town meeting, Article 12, FY13, operating budget, elementary schools in the amount of $21,558,039. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> That's unanimous. I move that the select board recommend to the April 30th, 2012 annual town meeting, Article 12, FY13, operating budget, regional school district in the amount of $28,527,558 and the appropriation of $13,796,524 for Amherst proportional share. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, <clears throat> that's unanimous. All right. Thank you very much for coming in. We appreciate all you. the information and we appreciate you, you. being here this evening. Good night. You too. Yes. Good night. Uh, next up, we have the library budgets. And we have Library Director Sharon Sherry, as well as two trustees, Tamson Ely and Chris Hoffman, here to talk to us about the library budget. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Hello. Brewer is doing all of the operating budget, so. Yeah. 
<laughs> until she until she says otherwise, we're just giving them all to Ms. Brewer. Yeah, it's all good. Ms. Sherry, welcome. What should we know about the library? Budget? Thank you very much for having me. Um, I wanted to say that this is a really exciting time for the Jones right now. Um, there's a lot of great changes going on. Uh, there's a lot of energy and enthusiasm over there. Uh, it's, you know, starting with the staff and it trickles on up to the trustees. I have just passed my six month mark and I, I finally feel like I have a solid foundation under my feet. Uh, a couple of the projects that we're working on includes, we're working on some job description updates. I don't think this has happened for the library in a very long time. Uh, so once that is complete, we'll be able to hire a new head of collections. And that is, that's not a new position, that used to be the adult services position, and that position's been vacant for over a year, a year and several months now at this point. Um, so staff are really excited about that. Uh, the other big deal is that we're working on upgrading the large meeting room, uh, soon to be called the Woodbury Room. Uh, the committee proposal will be presented to the trustees in a couple weeks at the May meeting, and if approved, construction will happen in August and September of this year. Some of our goals include expanding our funding sources. So we're always looking for more money. Um, and the trustees have talked about possibly hiring a fundraising consultant. Um, what, one of my big passions is uh, the, the layout of the building. It's a really crazy building over there. Um, and so I'm, I'm working on with staff and space planning consultants and the trustees about how we can provide a, a safe and friendlier uh, and more convenient space for our patrons, staff and the collections. Mm -hmm. And at some point, I would love to restore Monday morning hours, uh, as well as some maybe some other open uh, nighttime hours. Right now we're open Tuesday and Thursday nights. It would be great if we could be open Monday and Wednesday nights too, someday. Um, going to the chart in the Finance Committee report on page 21, um, I thought I'd run through a couple of the numbers with you under, so FY13, under costs for the materials budget, we have to spend $186,000 next year on books, books, magazines, uh, circulating materials uh, to meet our state aid requirement. Uh, under operations, that number uh, for FY13, that, that's a combination of the Munson Memorial Library rental and the endowment draw for that $402,000. As far as the endowment spending rate goes for next year, the trustees, they are dedicated to reducing that spending rate. And so for this year, for FY12, uh, the endowment uh, draw was, uh, the rate was 5.4% plus an additional $10,000. And for next year, they uh, decreased it to 5.4%, which doesn't seem like a big decrease, but it actually is because the endowment lost quite a bit of money. And then under sources of income, uh, the, the town general fund support, we are looking for a 2.8% increase. Um, as far as state aid, I'm expecting about $63,000 in state aid for next year. Sandy said that number, he saw updated cherry sheet number, so there may be a little bit more than that, but that's, that's the ballpark. Uh, as far as the annual fund, uh, we collected $38,000 from this year's annual fund, so we're lucky in that we get to spend that for next year. Um, and then for the Friends, uh, about $15,000 from the Friends. Uh, it's a guess, uh, we're hoping. Um, don donations everywhere have, have been down, so that's where that number comes from. And then the remainder of the costs will be uh, paid for using reserves. Um, there are no new initiatives in this uh, budget request other than the return of the head of collections position to be full-time. Um, uh, the previous adult services librarian was at, dropped down to 30 hours a week, and so I, I think the position is important enough to bring it back up to 37 and a half. Um, that's really it. This is the first time in I don't know how long that I, I've actually been given the possibility of an increase from a town. So I'm happy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, and congratulations on your first budget. Uh, as, as you noted, this is six months for you. So this is your maiden uh, budget process with the town of Amherst. And I'm glad it could be a good one. And uh, as I was saying with the with the school folks, uh, you've been, really been a wonderful partner in this whole uh, budget process. So thank you very much. Um, questions and comments from select board about library budget? That's easy. 
I just have to say that I just finished the, uh, I found some brief thing online, uh, the uh, biography of Samuel Minot Jones. So I'm just feeling really extra connected to the <laughs> library right now. And I agree this is a very exciting time for the library. So uh, it, it's, it's so important to be keeping these treasures of the community really alive and vital. So uh, thank you. Uh, if we have no questions or comments, then Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? Sure. I move that the select board recommend to the April 30th, 2012 annual town meeting, Article 12, FY13 <coughs> operating budget, <coughs> library, in the amount of $2,272,830 with town tax support of $1,690,000. $90,789, excuse me. So I read that again. Sure. One million six hundred and ninety thousand seven hundred eighty-nine dollars Second. Further discussion. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 That was unanimous. Thank you so Thank much. you very much. Thank you for coming in tonight. All right, next up, we have Community Preservation Act, and we have Mr. Jessup, chair of that committee, here to talk to us about this tonight. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Peter Jessup. I'm chair of the Community Preservation Act Committee, and um, I want to thank Diana Stein for being our um, liaison. That's one of the reasons the committee is not more dysfunctional than it already is. Um, <laughs> and true. we appreciate her contributions. Um, now that you've dealt with the multi-million dollar school budget, you get to hear briefly about the $532,000 that we're going to recommend in town meeting this year. So I will be brief. I know you have a lot of things on your agenda. Um, I won't go into the details of the act. I think everybody understands how that works. Um, we recommend a town meeting. The, the expenditure of uh, Community Preservation Act funds, can, town meeting can vote them up or down. Uh, they can't. Um, add additional money, they could, they could do less. So we, um, we got lots of uh, interesting proposals. Some were not really ready for a review. We sent them back for more thought. Um, and we, we recommended the vast majority of things that were brought to us this year. We're recommending a total of $532,834 in expenditures of CPA funds. In addition to that, there would be a Warren article somewhere um, that's more of a housekeeping nature that will place $200,000 in a budgeted reserve. Um, I, that, that's a, a bit of a, a really housekeeping so that we have the possibility of recommending that money at fall town meeting if we were to have a project. Our recommendations this year are relatively heavy on the housing side. We don't keep track on the committee as to percentages, um, but we do have more recommendations in affordable housing this year, I think, than, than ever before. But we're, and we're a little lighter on the open space, which we have had very significant amounts expended um, in previous years and um, the rest is uh, historic preservation and recreation. Some of these are for debt service. There's a total of $123,834 um, $123, for previous projects, the Plum Brook Recreation Area, Town Hall Masonry, Hawthorne property, and um, th those would be the, the projects that would be funded this year. The Amherst Housing Authority, we haven't yet borrowed from that, so we don't need to actually authorize any expenditures in that. We trust, you'll, we trust you'll recommend those since it causes you a great deal of problem if you don't. Um, and then for new projects, we're recommending $20,000 to Habitat for Humanity for construction of a new house on um, Belchertown Road uh, along Route 9 there. Uh, $250,000 towards the construction of the 42 units at Olympia Oaks. That's well underway in terms of planning and, and approvals. and. Um, we're going to be a, a player in that. Um, our, our total in that from CPA funds with this approval would be about 450,000 out of a 10 or 11 or 12 million dollar total development cost. So we're, we're pleased to be a part of that project. Um, on historic preservation, there's the West Cemetery fencing for the Dickinson plot at $40,000. The Amherst Historical Society roof repair at $25,000. The Amherst Historical Society database uh, creation of electronic database. Um, that, that was an interesting one to us. They have over 5,000 objects that have no categorization whatsoever. No one knows really what's there, where they came from, their provenance, or any other um, uh, much information about them. So this would be to create a, a searchable database for that collection. Uh, in addition to that, we're recommending $25,000 in open space and appraisals. That's a kind of a standard thing we do every year to uh, enable Dave Zomack and his staff to move quickly on appraisals without having to come back 
for specific allocations for specific projects and a $25,000 um, allocation for the um, Nickerson Farm, a uh, small parcel of land adjacent to the North Amherst Community Farm, and finally a $2,000 expenditure for administration f administrative funds to enable us to maintain our membership in the state organization that deals with CPA uh, across the Commonwealth, uh, as well as uh, we place a couple newspaper ads, so we have some small administrative funds. And that's it, I'd be happy to take questions. An excellent overview, thank you very much. Um, and we are fortunate to have Ms. Stein as our liaison to this committee, so she has kept us well informed. Um, do select board members have any questions or comments about the CPA recommendations? Um, I'll note I've been t praising process and collaboration a lot tonight, and this is another one of Amherst's great processes. I mean, this is a this is a terrific committee, has a really good way of taking in the recommendations from the different committees who are kind of the, the affinity groups for each of the CPA categories, as well as entertaining um, uh, proposals from folks who are outside of those committees. Um, and the, the process has really worked very well for Amherst. It's been very valuable, and uh, thank you for your sure. service. Happy to help out. Ms. Brewer. I'm very sorry if I missed this part in the report, but I know that there has been general discussion around the fact that there is, in theory, some additional money available uh, to the tune of $200,000 with the possibility of fall town meeting mm -hmm. um, looking at that. And so I just wondered if, if Mr. Jessup wanted to outline any process associated with that or what the CPA committee was expecting associated with that. Yeah, uh, we're, we're not, we, we can make recommendations to any town meeting as a okay. committee. We have, uh, years ago, um, we were asked to try and keep all of our expenditures in the spring town meeting so that we could um, mash as much as possible with JCPC. Um, and we've, we've respected that um, process to the extent that we're able. Um, this particular year, we, we, we thought we would have some open space uh, preservation uh, proposals that would be ready for Springtown meeting. They are in fact not ready. That doesn't stop Mr. Zomek and his staff from working diligently towards those. If those were to become available, it, it, real estate deals tend to be time sensitive. Mm -hmm. We would not want to ask people who to wait for Springtown meeting next year if a deal was ready this summer. If we could assure them that there might be funds available at fall town meeting, we would want to do that. So that's really the, the purpose of that. And we could entertain any and other proposals that might come before us in that time period. Nothing that we do is intended to disrespect the efforts of JCPC or any of that, but we do have the, um, we have the authority, as it were, to bring those to town meeting if we see fit. Um, we, will, we will probably not be widely advertising, um, I don't think, the um, request for proposals for, town, for fall town meeting, but if something came from a group that um, asked, asked about it, we would certainly entertain those. Ordinarily, we send out in uh, September a, a request for proposals. We uh, take the fall and winter to analyze and, and vet those and then vote on them prior to town, prior to, to, uh, town meeting and make the presentations to the various committees. That's really That's helpful, thank you. Good. Exactly what I was looking for. The money's sort of spoken for, but not really, <laughs> so, and about how the process generally works. And I do so appreciate- The, the $200,000 yeah. in budget or res yeah. reserve would be added to that pot, and then the total on that might be someplace between 200 and 250,000 that might be available. We, we don't need to spend it. We, we, right. it'll, it'll roll over to the spring if we don't have something right. for the fall town meeting. It's not that we're thinking, wow, we can, there's a specific project. We don't have any specific project in mind. Okay. So you don't need that money to count towards the 10% for the open no, space requirement? that's correct. We, we've, we've satisfied all of our okay, allocations. Great. Great. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Mr. Jessup? Ms. Stein. Sure. I move that the select board recommend to the April 30th, 2012 annual town meeting, Article 21, Community Preservation Act, Part A, in the amount of $384,000. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board recommend to the April 30th, 2012 annual town meeting, Article 21, Community Preservation Act, Part B, in the amount of $200,000. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board recommend to the April 30th, 2012 annual town meeting, Article 21, Community Preservation Act, Part C, in the amount of $25,000. Second. For the discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Aye, aye. that's unanimous. Thank, Thank you very you. much for coming in, we appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Ms. Stein, would you like to speak yes, to this? Yes, I would be happy to. Okay. Okay. 
because I'm done. <laughs> I think you're done and overdone. I'm so done. Uh, all right, next up. Oh, we, so we have free cash and stabilization. So we elected to not make Mr. Pooler come in for this as we already know what we're talking about. We spoke earlier, Mr. Musanti talked about the uh, Finance Committee being uh, ready to make a recommendation for $218,200 for the elementary school budget from free cash, as we discussed earlier. Um, I think typically what we do with this is we make a contingent motion, right? That we say that, that that's what we're supporting and if the situation changes, we'll try and take it up. Um, we would try and take it up at one of our meetings before uh, town meeting, but otherwise we wouldn't have a position on it. But the, the goal here consistent with our budget policy guidelines is that we're essentially not supporting other money coming out of reserves. We're trying to keep the, um, trying to keep the budget as recommended so it is consistent to recommend only that part. Are folks comfortable with that? Okay. Ms. Stein, would you like to make the free cash motion? Sure. I move that the select board recommend to the April 30th, 2012 annual town meeting article 22 free cash. Is that what you, I'm Second, not sure how you want amount? to we say want it. The amount, Ms. Yeah. Ms. My, my recommendation would be just add to the end of that in the amount of 218,200 okay. because that, that okay. uh, quite possibly will save you from having to meet about this prior to a town meeting okay. session or meet at all potentially okay. depending on how we're doing in That's town fine. meeting that and evening. That's fine. Stabilization <laughs> so encouraging. nothing. So right. we'll, right, we'll get to that it. in a second. So uh, second has been seconded for the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay. So stabilization, we're not looking, there will be no request to take any money out of stabilization. So that will be dismissed. Is that, that correct? Would, yeah. My, my recommendation here would be to have you take sure. a vote to recommend dismissal. Okay. With, with the same rationale as the free cash. Okay. Yeah. So I move that the select board recommend to the April 30th, 2012 annual town meeting article 23 dismissal of the stabilization fund to recommend dismiss yeah <laughs> i think recommend dismiss. Second, wording's yeah. funny yeah. isn't yeah. it yeah yeah, dismissal goes in there somewhere we know what or we maybe mean. put it at the end <laughs> <clears throat> okay uh is there a second second further discussion aye all in favor say aye. I'm ready to vote. <laughs> I'm ready to vote. <laughs> okay. It was tongue twisting. Unanimous. All right. Uh, articles 22 and 23, those are easy ones. Anyone want to speak to those? I'm happy to do it. All right. That's fine. It's yours. Okay. Next Unless up. somebody else wants to. I mean, I'm not. Oh, you can have. No. We have article 24, 25, and 26, our zoning articles. And we have Mr. Tucker here, Mr. Weber, and Mr. O'Keefe to talk to us about these. For anyone who is watching their very first select board meeting ever, I must disclose that I am married to the gentleman who is sitting at the public table right now, but this does not affect my ability to be neutral on the subject. <laughs> Okay, uh, 24 is uh, Form Bay Zoning in Atkins Corner. Welcome, what should we know about this? Thank you, I'm Jonathan O'Keefe, Chair of the Zoning Subcommittee of the Planning Board. Um, and what I'd like to do is talk about um, both Articles 24 and 25 together because they both pertain to rezoning projects that we've been working on on the Planning Board for more than a year now. Um, and. Um, and the most significant difference from last fall being now that they are two separate articles rather than being grouped together in, in one article as they were last fall. Um, so let me start out by um, just speaking about the motivation behind the articles um, is basically the same as it was last fall. Um, there's the prospect of significant redevelopment in the area around the old coal <coughs> sawmill in North Amherst as well as the prospect of significant new development in the area around Atkins Corners in South Amherst, uh, spurred by the road construction project there, um, and in particular the new peripheral ring road around Atkins Market that's already been constructed. Um, and so faced with the likelihood of uh, new development in South Amherst and redevelopment in North Amherst, uh, the board has been motivated for quite a while to make sure that any such development takes place in a uh, rational manner that's in keeping with the uh, expressed values of the community and works the way we want it to work. Uh, we want good functional development and not haphazard sprawl. Um, so these articles are an attempt to ensure that that takes place. 
Um, so as you know well, uh, we had an article on the warrant last fall that achieved significant support in town meeting but <clears throat> failed to achieve the two-thirds majority uh, required to pass. We've been working quite diligently since then to try to make changes to that article and hopefully bring it back to town meeting in a form that will pass this spring. Um, so we've, we've held a, a large number of public meetings, um, both the zoning subcommittee and notably the planning board as well has been much more involved uh, this cycle with the development uh, of the two articles that we're bringing to town meeting. Um, we've had a series of discussions at planning board meetings um, to get input uh, both from the public and from members of the board. Um, and members of the board have been very active in giving us feedback and suggestions and helping us improve the articles uh, this spring. So just uh, quickly, I know you all have seen this before last year, so I won't go into great detail about how the zoning works. I'd like to spend most of my time talking about the changes that we were proposing uh, relative to the article that we brought last fall. Um, but just at a, at a very high level, um, an overview of how this zoning could work. Um, we talk about this in shorthand often as a, a form-based code project or form-based code proposal, um, but it's really more than that. It really is a village center rezoning project, two village center rezoning projects, one in North Amherst and one in South Amherst. Um, and as part of those re rezoning projects, we're proposing to use form-based code for the first time in Amherst zoning bylaw. Um, but apart from form-based code, it's important to bear in mind that we are proposing traditional zoning in both of those areas. So th these articles would create two new zoning districts, one in North Amherst called the North Amherst Village Center, NAVC, and one in South Amherst around Atkins Corners called Atkins Corners, AC. Um, and both of those would function just as traditional zoning districts do, just like all the other zoning districts in um, our existing zoning by bylaw do. Um, they would allow or disallow a range of uses and specify the permit requirements, whether things are allowed by right through site, through site plan <clears throat> review or uh, through special permit from the ZBA. Um, and people are used to dealing with that. There's no changes from our existing zoning bylaw in how that works. Um, there are changes um, from the existing zoning that's on the ground there today in terms of the mix of uses that would be allowed by these two new zoning districts. Um, in general, they're much more tailored to and appropriate for uh, village center areas. Um, in particular relative to the existing zoning that's on the ground today in North Amherst, which is largely commercial, which is uh, really an automotive-based, sprawl-promoting type of zoning um, that's not appropriate for the area around a village center. Um, so th th these articles would create two new zoning districts, one in North Amherst, as I said, one in South Amherst, and they would also use form-based code in those two districts as well as selected areas uh, immediately adjacent to them. So form-based code, um, as we've discussed extensively over the course of the last year or so um, in a series of um, meetings and educational sessions um, is a relatively new uh, zoning concept that's been used increasingly around the country and in the Northeast for the past uh, 10 or 15 years um, to try to guide development in a way that ensures that what gets built um, works for a community, that it, it preserves the look and feel of neighborhoods, it preserves their character. Um, it ensures that public spaces function the way that we want them to, that we get pedestrian-friendly development that's not really aimed at primarily automotive uses, um, which is what happens a lot of the time if you don't have control over that type of thing. Um, so it ensures that buildings are well connected together, that they're connected to the pedestrian, bicycle, infrastructure, um, public transit, and so on. Um, so form-based code, well, we have a series of form-based design regulations that would um, apply in both North Amherst and in South Amherst. Um, and there's also um, overlay districts where those form-based regulations would apply in small areas um, immediately around the village centers, um, but without changing the underlying zoning that's on the ground today. So that's kind of a high-level overview of, of how the, the whole thing would work. Um, so now I'd like to focus um, on maybe a dozen or so areas where we've made significant changes since last fall. Um, and I also want to draw your attention to a document that you probably have in your packets. It's certainly part of the town meeting mailing um, that's entitled Articles 24 and 25 of Village Center Rezoning, What's Different Since Last Fall, um, which contains a much more detailed series of, of notes. I'm not going to drill down into 
all the, the specific changes that we made to definitions and things like that. Um, but that document is a great overview of, um, of all the stuff that has changed. So in, in terms of the most significant ones, uh, I've already mentioned the fact that this is two articles rather than one. Um, one of the most significant items of feedback that we got from people last time around was they wanted to have the opportunity to make an up or down vote on each of the two areas separately rather than having them be lumped together. Um, and we heard that loud and clear. And so we've designed the whole process this time to give them that opportunity. So we have two separate articles. Article 24, which is the first one on the warrant, deals with South Amherst around Atkins Corners. Article 25, which is totally separate, um, deals with North Amherst. Um, the structure of the articles is designed to, um, the, the, the way the language is worded in the warrant is designed to facilitate that division. Um, and so what happens in each one of the two articles is that there's three separate sections in the, um, in the warrant article language. The first of those three sections would apply or would create a, a, the bulk of the text that constitutes the form-based regulations, Article 16 in the zoning bylaw, um, not to be confused with the numbering of the articles on the warrant, um, which always gets people every time. Um, but so that the first section would create Article 16, new section of the zoning bylaw, without any of the particular aspects that apply either to North Amherst or South Amherst. The second section in each article would apply those specific locations, uh, specific aspects um, for Article 24 in uh, Atkins Corners and in Article 25 in North Amherst. And then the third section of each one would make the changes that are required in the zoning map to, uh, to implement the new regulations uh, in the zoning map. Um, and the way that it's structured that way is so that if the first article were to pass or, or fail, basically the second article could function independently. What will happen if Article 24 passes is that the first section of Article 25 won't be necessary, and so we just won't move that section as part of, part of Article 25. But it needed to be there to allow for the possibility that Article 24 might not pass, um, and if it does, then we would move the entirety of Article 25. So that's the, the structure of how that's laid out. Um, going back to the, the changes, and that's one of the changes, um, but one of the more significant changes uh, since the fall has been um, changes in the, the maps of how the zoning would be applied in both North Amherst and South Amherst. Um, another change is that we have better maps to begin with. We've got a more logical and, and well-structured series of maps um, in both areas that shows, um, first of all, it shows the existing zoning on the ground. It shows um, really detailed changes that would um, take us from the existing zoning to the new zoning. And then there's a separate map that shows you just what the zoning would look like um, if the articles were to pass. Um, so looking at the map specifically, the, um, the most significant change is um, in both areas, but particularly in North Amherst, um, the scope of the new zoning district has been reduced considerably. Um, we cut down areas of NAVC um, to the west that were largely undevelopable or protected lands or, or things that uh, areas where the, um, the new NAVC zoning wouldn't necessarily be appropriate. Um, and we made other changes uh, to trim around the edges of that. Um, we also last fall proposed a changing the zoning along Montague Road um, to RVC. Um, the people along Montague Road have been telling us all along they don't want to be part of um, an AVC, and we've respected that. Um, last fall, we had proposed instead changing that zoning to RVC, which is Village Center Residence, um, and they weren't happy with that either, um, and they w really wanted to limit the scope of that, and so we heard those concerns. And um, right now what we're proposing is a small RVC section just along the southernmost portion of Montague Road that's north of the Mill River itself and south of the um, entrance to the Mill River Recreational Area. Um, that's the area where the old mill building is. Um, it has a history of commercial uses, um, and it's immediately adjacent to the, the central part of the village center. So we felt that RVC is appropriate there, but not for the areas stretching further north along Montague Road. Um, and so those areas along Montague Road would retain their existing zoning, with the exception of the parcel at 134 Montague Road, which is the Coles family homestead, which again has a long history of commercial uses associated with it. Um, so the RVC is smaller, the NAVC um, and Atkins Corner is smaller. Also, I didn't mention Atkins Corners. Uh, the Atkins Corner Zoning District um, 
we've also trimmed that one around the edges a little bit. The same kinds of concerns I expressed in the north where um, there were some concerns about um, interaction of the uh, new zoning district with the Rod and Gun, Center, Rod and Gun Club that's uh, to the south on the, up, up on the hill on the notch. Um, and, uh, and also uh, wetlands and, um, and concerns about developing there. So we've pulled the, um, the Atkins Corner Zoning District back a little bit in the southeastern portion um, to address those concerns. The other area that we've made smaller is the overlay district that I mentioned earlier, um, particularly in North Amherst. We had proposed sections along Montague Road, along Pine Street, and along Meadow Street that would have this new um, overlay district which would apply the form-based regulations. Um, we've trimmed that down a lot um, in response to feedback that we got. Um, and right now we're proposing to only add that overlay district in the areas that are zoned RVC um, immediately adjacent to the North Amherst Village Center. Um, so again, just um, the, the ones that are closer and closer into the, the actual center of the village center. Um, so all of those have been in response to concerns that we've heard from people wanting us to take a more measured step-by-step -step approach um, and to start small and see how it works. Um, and so we've responded to that um, by, by making significant changes to the scope of the maps. Um, so some of the other changes that we've made as well relative to last fall, um, we changed the permit requirement on townhouses from uh, site plan review allowed by Wright, which was the original proposal, to special permit. Um, we actually moved that on the floor of town meeting that way last fall, um, although it didn't get much attention. Um, and that this, this is different now from what was actually proposed originally last fall. So with that change, both of the large scale multi-unit residential uses in the two new village center zoning districts would require a special permit. So you wouldn't be able to build them by right. You would have to go before the ZBA and get a special permit for any large scale multi-unit uh, residential construction. We also made changes, um, in, speaking of townhouses and apartments, um, we added some language in the terms and conditions for those uses to ensure that those uses don't dominate the areas around Sunderland Road and Coles Road, um, which was a concern that people brought to us as well. Um, so there's language in there that says that um, multi-unit residential uses aren't allowed to dominate the streetscape along those areas. Um, the idea being, of course, that we want to encourage a, a diversity of uses and have a wide range of uses and not have it be dominated um, by any one use in particular and in particular residential uses so there's language to prevent that from happening um, we made changes to the building coverage and lot coverage dimensional regulations in the two new zoning districts um, to bring them in line to be the same as um, the existing um, dimensional regulations in the uh, <coughs> village center business district um, so those are reductions as well um, we made a lot of uh, smaller changes in the language to clarify and improve some of the design regulations, um, in particular those having to do with public transit, street trees, handicapped accessibility, um, and several other areas. Um, so there are improvements to the uh, form-based design regulations themselves. Um, another change that we made that um, some people had questions about last fall was um, there's a series of descriptions of street types in the beginning of the form-based um, regulations. Um, and there was some confusion about exactly how much the zoning could control what goes on in the public way. Obviously, the public way is something that, that this board is in charge of and, and not um, controlled through zoning. But yet, the form-based regulations that we're proposing um, govern the way that a site interacts with the public way through its driveways, through its uh, um, pedestrian access and things like that. So the street illustrations that we have do show public way and, it do, and they do show the connection of sites to that public way, but they've been clarified to, to, um, to make clear the fact that this is not something that's directly governed by zoning and instead happens through the, uh, the select board. Um, another change that we made is in the section 16.91, um, which is the alternative compliance section. Um, there is a provision in the form-based regulation that says essentially that um, the permitting board has the ability um, in the case where they're presented with uh, a design that might not um, exactly match up with the regulations that we have 
put in here. We're not intending to prevent um, new, and new and creative uses uh, that people might come to us with. Um, and so there's sort of a safety valve in there that says that if somebody wants to do something good that conforms with the spirit of the regulations um, and conforms to a bunch of specific findings in there, then the board is allowed to consider that. Um, that was their last time around, but we've strengthened that language <coughs> to make clear exactly what um, public purposes that you have to prove that you're serving um, if you're seeking this alternative compliance under that section. Um, and the final one I want to mention is um, just in the series of illustrations that are illustrating the various building and site types in there. Um, we got some feedback from people who were concerned about uh, that not reflecting our local character enough. So we went out and, um, and got an extensive library of illustrations of things in North Amherst and South Amherst and elsewhere in town. Um, and we use those fairly extensively um, in illustrating the various building and site types. Um, we also kept some other examples in there also. It's not intended just to be a catalog of local architecture, um, but it's also intended to give you an idea of um, things that might be worthy of emulation, not just uh, preservation. So there's a mix of both Amherst-specific examples and examples drawn from elsewhere, uh, but they're predominantly local examples. So those are the major areas I wanted to cover. Again, there's a lot more in that specific document that I referenced, um, and I also want to draw people's attention to the planning board report, which is, um, as usual, detailed and thorough uh, description of the changes that this article would make, um, and that is also included in the mailing that went out to town meeting members. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions or comments? Mr. Misanti. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, for the benefit of the select board, uh, restate uh, my enthusiastic support as town manager for uh, this proposal uh, for village center rezoning contained in articles 24 and 25 and I encourage uh, town meeting members to show the ex show their support for these articles uh, at the upcoming town meeting uh, first and f foremost uh, I believe the proposal, which was unanimously uh, recommended by the planning board, uh, promotes sustainability. So what does that mean? Uh, I think it's part of the Amherst community's effort to implement uh, the community's master plan. Uh, I believe it increases local sustainability by reducing sprawl, uh, locating any new development near existing transportation centers, employment centers, uh, closer to goods and services, uh, by doing, uh, attempting to incentivize development in, in the village center areas, we think that leads to decreased uh, overall energy use. It increases the economic vitality of the town and its village centers while still providing access to active farmland uh, and generally reducing uh, environmental impacts. Uh, secondly, uh, I believe this has been a thorough process that has, uh, is resulting in a balanced uh, proposal. Uh, while there's been very intensive uh, uh, tweaking and reshaping of this proposal since the November uh, uh, special town meeting, the active development of this proposal has been taken about a full year now with lots of uh, opportunities for community input, input public participation uh, and I think the proposal that's been recommended to town meeting uh, uh, adequately balances all of the community's uh, sometimes competing interests. Uh, as Mr. O'Keefe has uh, laid out uh, in some detail and which is contained in the uh, support materials for these articles, uh, the proposal that's before the annual town meeting, I, b I agree, uh, is... Uh, very responsive to uh, the community input that has been received uh, and has resulted in a number of changes um, uh, from last fall's original proposal, which as you may remember, uh, there was 60% uh, of town meeting voted to support the rezoning proposals at the November town meeting, which uh, in most kind of votes is uh, bordering on a landslide victory, but in, in the uh, state laws and as it relates to zoning and, and adopting changes to zoning, a supermajority or two-thirds vote is required. So that proposal, while 
gaining a lot of support fell just short. I think the revised proposal has taken the, the constructive feedback that was received at town meeting and from community members before and after and attempted to reshape it. Uh, three main areas out of the 12 or so that Mr. O'Keefe mentioned, uh, there's really now two articles instead of one. So uh, structured in a way for uh, the Atkins Corner and North Amherst pieces of the rezoning to be voted on separately. Uh, the area impacted by the rezoning proposals in both locations has been reduced. Uh, and uh, the regulations that are recommended uh, have been adjusted, uh, and particularly as it relates to multi-unit residential unit, unit uses, uh, the process being more stringent, requiring a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, so I think for all of those reasons, uh, uh, the Articles 24 and 25 for Village Center rezoning are worthy of town meeting support, and I hope town meeting will, uh, will act favorably on them as we come into a, what we hope and believe is a fledgling but beginnings of a positive economic cycle. This is an opportunity for uh, the town of Amherst and its elected representatives in town meeting to seize the moment and, and shape uh, regulations and zoning to encourage the kind of uh, uh, community and village centers that uh, we aspire to uh, in, as expressed in the community's master plan. Thank you very much. Ms. Stein. I'd like to thank the um, planning board and the zoning subcommittee prior to the planning board for laying things out so clearly. I think that really makes a huge difference. Um, and I think also the fact that, as Mr. Musanti said, that you were so responsive to the issues that were raised and that made people unhappy will make a big difference. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wald and Mr. Hayden. Also very grateful, uh, just personally, as one who lives at one end of town and works on the other, of course, I'm going to see this every day. So I appreciate the attempt to make those parts of town more functional and attractive. But I think also, uh, you know, three of us on this committee, as it turns out, worked on the master plan. And we have to have a master plan according to state law. But one of the triggers really for the process finally taking, uh, taking off was the recognition that our phase growth bylaw was unconstitutional. At least there were precedents that suggested that. And we talked about the need to replace that. As it turned out, town meeting did not uh, decline to adopt, let us say, the phased, uh, the the development modification bylaw that was to replace it. But one of the questions we kept hearing during the master planning process is, how do you know it's not going to sit in the shelf? What's it going to do? Well, here's the answer. I think right now we've got two really important pieces coming before us that are, represent the master plan and its principles. And the local historic district is another. And so I think you know this is, this is what the plan is intended to do. It's focused the debate in all sorts of useful ways. And we haven't always agreed on what the plan means, but there's been a common standard of debate and I think whatever comes out of this is better. And again, I, I agree the process has been good. I think uh, I was impressed with the way that the planning board and the zoning subcommittee conducted the discussions and listened to public comment. I think the compromises represented here are reasonable. That is, they address a lot of the residents' concerns, but they retain the essence of what the plan was intended to do. And I guess I would just say that I think it's important that we start putting the master plan into effect in these ways and that we realize it is a compromise and that no one is going to get everything that he or she wants. So that's, I mean, that's the tough thing. At some point we have to decide that we've all given a little bit and we can all take a little bit. And I think this is a good example of how that process works. Thank you very much. Mr. Hayden. All of that. Um, it, is, it is very interesting to see how the 1,500 or so uh, unique comments that we got during the master planning process have distilled themselves first into the goals and objectives, and thank you for including that in the package, by the way, and now into actual rezoning. Um, I, I want to reemphasize um, or to, to, to reappreciate the work of the zoning subcommittee and the planning board with, with um, working with folks. In fact, I'm kind of excited. All of the work that you've been doing with the, the people who showed up every night, every Wednesday night for a year, uh, to take that work and bring it to the 240 some odd rest of us um, who are you know, waiting with bated breath to see this. 
Um, all of that, though, um, I, I do have a question. Um, I actually know the answer to this, but I'm hoping that, that you will, you'll answer it for the folks uh, in, in television land out there. Um, in many ways, this proposal um, represents sort of a uniquely Amherst approach to form-based code and uh, the old use-based code. Um, in another way, it's not that unique, and I'm hoping that you'll be able to speak to other communities that have adopted um, um, regulations like this and the successes that they've had, because I know there are several. Sure. Well, it, it, it's definitely not unique um, in the sense that, as I mentioned at the outset, um, there are a, a series of communities around the country that have uh, implemented this type of regulations. Um, each community tends to do it in their own way, um, and the challenge that people often face is that they're trying to adopt what's essentially a new style of zoning regulation um, without totally disrupting their existing zoning infrastructure. Um, some people have gone and really overhauled everything and, and done everything using form-based codes, but that's not common. It's more common to see people doing the type of thing that we're doing here, which is to do it um, typically in a limited geographic area. Um, and so that's what we've seen um, in areas like Saratoga Springs, New York, which is one of the most prominent local examples of um, a community that's been using form-based zoning for close to 10 years now. Um, also in Massachusetts, the city of Lowell, as part of one of their downtown redevelopment projects, um, also implemented essentially a form-based code um, several years ago, um, it, it, again in a limited area. So, um, so there are examples out there of people doing pretty much what we tried to do. Of course, their regulations don't look the same as ours, um, but the, the, the style of trying to, to blend together um, the, the traditional zoning infrastructure that, that we all have um, with uh, some of these innovative techniques is, is not unheard of. Uh, lots of people are doing it. And there's a lot of other examples out there around the country, too. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Ms. Burr. Um, two things. One is, let's see, page four of the What's Different has toward the bottom under use classification, which for those following at home is on pages 59 and 60 of our lovely large report. There's the phrase significant continuous segments of street frontage. Mm -hmm. And then when I read the whole paragraph in this, it made even more sense to me. But what, what's the response to someone who says, well, you know, what's the limitations of how the people interpreting you know, this can apply that? Um, that's a good question. We went back and forth on that um, quite a bit. And our original instinct was actually to have fairly detailed numerical mm -hmm. limitations rather than the, the broadly worded right. significant continuous segments. Um, and, um, and we eventually decided that it was a little, uh, conditions might differ from even one part of a street to another or one street mm -hmm. to another certainly. Um, and obviously what's proposed for any given project. We're not looking at a project here, we're just looking at what's allowed and what's not allowed. You, you could have a project maybe that, um, you, you could have two different projects, one of which you might feel it was appropriate to have more coverage and one you might feel mm -hmm. it was less appropriate depending on the details of how the project was proposed. Um, so what we decided to do is, was go with the, the more, um, less specific language, the significant continu continuous segments and basically leave that up to the permitting board. And there's plenty of precedent for that in, in both our zoning bylaw today and in, uh, elsewhere in the form-based regulations um, for the permitting board to be able to decide um, what constitutes uh, significant continuous segments. So that's just a, another decision that they would have to make um, to decide when that threshold had been crossed, but yet the language is there. So you'd have a hard time arguing that right. a project that really did cover yes. you know, 90% of the street frontage with multi-unit buildings, um, that, that would be fairly easy to shoot down at the permitting level. Mr. Thank Tucker, you. I want to add to that. Insight as to how that came about. I think part of the uh, answer is contained in the full language. We only right. uh, excerpted the phrase here. But whether you were uh, referring to townhouses or apartments, 
Uh, developments proposed on Coles Road are not intended to occupy significant continuous segments of street frontage to the exclusion of other uses, but instead to contribute to a village center streetscape composed of and providing a balanced mix of diverse uses. Yep. That That's would a be a little a easier more. to apply. Yeah. Mr. Walt. On that subject, I had a similar question in part because it also keeps coming up with regard to the local historic district. And I think we're often caught between these two sort of extremes. We have language that people say is vague, or we try to specify everything, and then we're told the regulations are too intrusive and detailed. So how does one, this is more of a philosophical question, but you're a smart guy, so. <laughs> how, do, how do we best reassure people that good judgments will, will be made? And I, you know, I, I point out, too, that the, the select board has not acted exactly in the manner of its predecessors, and I'm sure our successors will not emulate us in every regard either. So how do we, uh, best convince the public that we've achieved the right mixture of flexibility and uh, calculability when we say it's up to the permitting body? Yeah, that, that's another good question. And, and the battle between trying to be too specific and detailed and too general and vague kind of sums up all of our <laughs> zoning struggles that I've been involved with over the past several years. But um, I guess the, the best answer I could give to that is to, to look around at how things are running now. I mean, that, that, that's not a new concept that's being introduced here, that, that pervades our existing regulations. And so every time my board, the planning board, sits down and considers a site plan review um, application, and I know that every time the ZBA sits down and considers a special permit application, they have a long list of things that they have to go through. We have a long list of things that we have to go through um, and, and make specific determinations about whether or not a project is going to you know, significantly impact its neighbors through noise, dust, vibration, all kinds of various things, or whether it um, is going to impact the, the view shed and things like that. Um, We've been, boards in this town have been making decisions about that type of thing since our zoning has existed. I mean, and generally people are comfortable with that process and um, presumably relatively happy with the outcomes in most cases. So um, it, it's not a new concept that's being introduced. It's really quite a familiar um, decision making process. Other questions or comments about articles 24 or 25? Ms. Brewer. Quick question about the votes. Do you have nine members on the planning board now and you've got seven members voting? Just we're not going to hear anything suddenly new and exciting from other members. I, I certainly believe that that's true. Um, the, the votes that we had, um, we had two separate public hearings because it's two separate articles. And we do have nine members on the board now. Um, and one member was late that evening. Um, so he missed the first public hearing and thus we ended up with, I believe it was an 8-0 vote in support with one member absent. That member came in halfway through the public hearing of the second article and um, desired to vote in favor of it, in favor of recommending it, um, but was advised that due to the fact that he wasn't present for the entirety of the public hearing that it would be wise to abstain and he did so, um, just as a technical matter but not through any concerns about the substance, I believe. And so just to clarify, there was actually one other member absent that night, right? Because don't our vote totals Ours. eight rather than nine? So somebody wasn't there at all. Okay. I, I'm sorry, yes. Yeah, so, so we had one member who came in during the meeting and then there was someone who wasn't there at all. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate knowing that. Other questions or comments on 24 and 25? Anything else you'd like to add for us to know? I think that covers it. Okay. Um, so I would just note that... Uh, I, I really appreciate how much this has been brought to the master plan and, and how it's framed in the packet materials and how we've been talking about it here tonight. This is not a process that started with the North Amherst Charette. This is a process that started years and years ago with the community really envisioning broadly what it was looking for, um, how, how we want to develop and grow uh, for the future. So, so this is a long process with, with a great deal of community input. Um, and in particular, what has happened since last fall has been an extraordinary amount of community input also it, the uh, the feedback that was gained at town meeting and since town meeting was extremely valuable in shaping the proposals that are coming before us now um, as folks have mentioned it is extremely responsive to those concerns and 
So again, this, this process has played out in a very successful way. I think you can sort of sum it up by saying that it is the, uh, the, the same proposal as was brought in the fall, except made a bit smaller and made a bit more conservative. This is less risky for the community to kind of wrap its arms around because it's, it's covering a smaller area. And uh, as Mr. O'Keefe mentioned, the, the kind of the big fears of the, the townhouses and apartments, those are both by special permit. We're taking it easy with this, you know, we're, we're going in gradually, but, uh, but helping to shape the North Amherst and Atkins Corners village centers that, that uh, the community has identified they want to be um, growing and vibrant for the future. So I think it's, I think it's an excellent approach, really well conceived, and, uh, and I, I hope and believe that town meeting will be very, uh, very receptive to that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, if there's no other comments, Ms. Stein, would you like to make a motion? Sure. I move that the select board recommend to the April 30th, 2012 annual town meeting, Article 24, form based zoning and North Amherst rezoning. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That was unanimous. Article 25. I, rec I move that the select board recommend to the April 30th, 2012 annual town meeting, Article 25, form-based zoning and North Amherst Village Center rezoning. I think that word got left off. Did it? I wasn't listening. Oh, that's right. That I, you know, I read that in the motion sheet. The first one was supposed to say Atkins Corners for oh, Article so 24. <coughs> so we'll consider so that as amended. Uh, article 24, which we just voted on, and now Article 25 is, is not Atkins Amherst. Corner. No, it's the other way around. Right. Okay. Right. 25, so so Amherst it's Amherst. Atkins Corner rezoning and then North Amherst Village Center rezoning. Or okay. Would you like me to read them again? Sure. Why not? I move that the select board recommend to the April 30th, 2012 annual town meeting Article 24 form based zoning and Atkins Corner rezoning. Second. I knew what you meant. <laughs> Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous. I move that the select board recommend to the April 30th, 2012 annual town meeting, Article 25, form-based zoning, and North Amherst Village Center rezoning. Second. Are they both Further discussion? Yeah. All in favor say aye. 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 All in favor say aye. 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 words. Thank you very much. Okay, excellent. Article 26. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Hayden. I would speak to those two. Okay, yeah, you guys might want to talk about uh, what you say, too, because Mr. Wald spoke to them last time, oh. so it might you be valuable, to too. I can't. Okay. You can uh, speak to them. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I meant you could collaborate, and I, I just didn't did. mean to uh, <laughs> collaboration at his best. Okay, <laughs> Mr. Wald is taking this. Very good. Article 26, parking. <laughs> That's right, I forgot. Thank you. I very much appreciate your support on those articles. Um, article 26 is also quite similar to an article that you've seen before. Um, last spring, we had an article on the town meeting warrant dealing with parking regulations. Um, this is, that, that was at that point and still is, an attempt to address the fact that parking is one of the most frequent nuisance creating issues that we have in various aspects of life in this college community. Um, and our existing zoning regulations do speak to parking um, to a fair extent, um, although not in the best possible way. And so we felt for a long time that they um, needed to be cleaned up and revised. Um, and so the article last spring, as, as well as this article, is an attempt to do that. Um, all of this needs to be considered through the lens of how zoning regulations work and the fact that existing uses are always allowed to continue. It, it, legal conforming existing uses are always allowed to continue when the zoning is changed. And so these parking changes would mainly apply to new construction and not to existing properties, which is obviously a significant limitation, but one that we have to live with in the world of zoning. Um, as you all are aware, the town is conducting a parallel effort to make revisions to the general bylaws to introduce some of the same concepts, um, uh, an effort that wasn't ready in time for this spring's town meeting, but we hope that will be available in the relatively near future. But for the time being, we do have the, the zoning changes um, 
available to us and, and we felt that they were ready for this spring's town meeting um, and so we'd like to see town meeting support them. Um, so the, the, the main issue, the most significant issue that our parking regulations through zoning um, are impacted by, or, or, or the most significant aspect of our um, parking regulations in the zoning is a section that says that you're only allowed to park two cars in the front setback of a property. Excuse me one second. You're going to get a battery change. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're not quite ready yet. <laughs> we could hear it through the uh, speakers. No problem. Testing, are we good with this one? That sounds good. Okay. Where was I? Um, no so, on lawns. <laughs> so what this, um, the, the most significant aspect of this article would prevent um, parking on the lawn. It would require that all parking in a residential property take place on a paved and prepared parking surface. Um, it does several other things um, in terms of the design regulations for parking areas, in particular for larger parking areas, anything with five or more spaces. Um, it requires that, um, first of all, if you're building such an area, building such a parking area that you tell the town about it so that the town knows that it's there and can enforce the regulations. Um, it requires that the spaces be marked and delineated um, and it has requirements for lighting the parking area as well. This is all only for larger areas, again, with five or more parking spaces. Spaces. Um, so, so that's the, the design related aspect of it. Um, and it also um, makes some, it, it puts in some language about specifically what types of surfaces are appropriate and how they need to be prepared and things like that. But the most significant aspect of it is, is the parking on the lawn aspect, that you wouldn't be able to do that anywhere on the property. Um, subject, again, to the caveat that I mentioned earlier, that existing uses are grandfathered as with all zoning changes. Questions or comments on parking, Ms. Brewer? I hesitate when people say, what about the house near me? But I'm kind of going to do that anyway. Um, so when it talks about grandfathered properties, there are fraternities in town that definitely are parking all over lawns at this point. So where are they likely to fit into this? Are they likely to, that's okay based on something they had before? Or? Um, yes, basically. So there's nothing wrong with parking on the lawn now as long as you're right. not having more than two cars in your front setback. So, um, so provided that they're operating legally in, in other aspects of their, use, aspects then, of their use, then they're able to continue doing that. Yes. Fine. But it's still the setbacks are still, is that limitation is 
still there. I mean, that exists yes, it, you, now. You, as it is now, yes. Um, you, you still would not be allowed to park more than two vehicles in the front setback. That's there now. And there are properties that violate that all over the place. So right. those are subject to enforcement so, today and, and would continue to be subject because to that enforcement. Change. All right. And now that we have an excellent new code enforcement exactly. officer, thank you all exactly. very much for that. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to address yep. those more proactively. Excellent. Thank you. Other questions about Article 26? Mr. Hayden. Also, I, I, as I was reading this again, I noticed an ancillary benefit. Um, uncontrolled parking on side lawns, of course, encourages erosion. I bicycle around a lot, and I see mm -hmm. muddy ruts, and mm -hmm. this will prevent those as well. Um, just one point of clarification there. You mentioned renovation, and that's an issue that came up in our discussion about it. Um, just to clarify then, in general, renovation to a property would not trigger um, the enforcement of the, it's the change of use. So in particular, um, a situation that we deal with a fair amount is a conversion from a single family house to a duplex. That's a change of use, and so the new regulations would apply. But if you're putting on a new porch or a new roof or, or something like that, um, that, that would not trigger this. Thank you. Mr. Musanti. Yeah, I would uh, also lend my enthusiastic support to Article 26, uh, residential parking design regulations. And, you know, this is a small but important step forward, I think. We talk about the Safe and Healthy Neighborhood Initiative, broadly defined. Uh, the cars parking all over the lawn is a, a visual to keep in mind about what we're trying to minimize going forward. And so even though uh, under the zoning laws of the Commonwealth, uh, pre-existing uses are essentially grandfathered, uh, it still uh, sends a very clear statement of what the town and its town meeting believe are best practices, even for a grandfathered use, you know, to help shape, you know, future future uh, positive changes in an individual property and in a neighborhood uh, going forward. So I really hope that we can get behind this. Thank you. Uh, question, you referenced that there's uh, consideration of a general bylaw which would take out the grandfathering issue and that would suddenly apply to everyone. Um, is that something the planning board is working on or is that something the Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods team is working on? And so why didn't that come first? So I can't speak to who specifically inside Town Hall is working on it. It's not being actively addressed by the planning board, but my understanding is that there are there is a group that has been working for some time on de developing that type of regulation. Okay, so that's a safe and healthy neighborhoods thing? Yes. Um, is there any particular reason to sequence it this way? It almost seems like it would make more sense to start with the, well, I mean, if you have a general bylaw, you don't need the other bylaw, but uh, um, so, I'm, well, I don't know why we wouldn't start with the general. Right, so, so one aspect of this is that the idea of doing it generally is not without controversy. So this is an issue that, that will cut both ways and there will be people who are interested in, in sort of maximizing the use of their property that, that won't be happy about strict, stricter enforcement of uh, parking regulations so there's there's certainly the possibility that um, those regulations might look different than these um, they, might, they might be balancing a different set of interests in the community so this is this is built on what we have on in place already we do have parking regulations um, in place today um, we do have some design aspects of those regulations so this um, builds on that it makes it stronger um, and as mr. Musanti said it's an incremental step um, hopefully one that we can take that will have some degree of positive impact um, but uh, but the larger question of the bylaws will have to it, it'll need more scrutiny and more public input to make sure that it reflects the, the concerns of, of everybody involved thank you very much other questions or comments article 26 Ms. Stein would you like to make the motion I move that the select board recommend to the April 30th, 2012 annual town meeting, Article 26, residential parking design. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Mr. Hayden, would you like that one? Sure. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for all of the good information and for really the extraordinary amount of work that the Planning Board and Zoning Subcommittee have put into um, the revisions of all of these articles. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, for, you for your support. Thank you.
Okay. Um, yes. Ms. Yes. Gore. Again, just the extensive amount of materials. I mean, on the one hand, it's overwhelming, but on the other hand, there's lots of different ways that they've addressed the issues through these different types of handouts, which I think really helps the variety of town meeting members look at their concerns. Absolutely. Thank you. Right. Correct. Thank you. Okay, I'll note Mr. Hayden can take his microphone back if he would like from the public table. Um, and we also have to go back and do the street acceptance for Sunrise Ave. I apologize. I thought Mr. Mooring was going to come in tonight, but I guess not. Um, we have in our packets the plan for Sunrise Ave, and I know just a little bit about it because I presented it at warrant review. Um, this is a very short street that is off of uh, South Whitney Street, and it has about a half dozen properties on it, um, including including a, a housing authority property. And there was an agreement with the housing authority that I believe they paid to pave it or something like that with the understanding that um, with the paving and whatever else needed to happen, it would then meet town standards and be petitioned for acceptance as a public way. Um, so uh, DPW has confirmed that it does in fact meet all the standards for a public way. And we have the map of it and the plan in our packet. Um, and just a word about process. We have uh, two motions on this, and we also have a motion to um, that that um, clarifies and, and makes more official the uh, recommendation that we made on the alternative layout of University Drive that we considered a couple of weeks ago. And I think this is because town council is just paying more attention to us on this issue suddenly. <laughs> we, uh, so just to make sure that we're absolutely technically correct on how we do this, we are both accepting, the, uh, we are calling for the layout. We are, we are laying out, in fact, um, the plans for both of those streets. And that's a technical part of this process as far as how it advances. So we will retroactively do that with the University Drive one. And we will do that also with uh, sun, Sunrise. If I called it Sunset before, I apologize. Uh, I keep doing that. Uh, just like the building commissioner and the code enforcement officer. I'm going to screw these up forever. Um, Sunrise Av, so we will we will accept, we will lay those out, uh, and upon that acceptance, we will also recommend the articles. Anything else, Mr. Mussanti? I would just add that uh, both, these, both of these uh, uh, streets become uh, action that's before you in town meeting is recommended by, by the appropriate staff, Public Works, and also both have, uh, at the most recent planning board meeting, attained a unanimous recommendation from the planning board. To accept the streets as proposed. Ms. Stein. Um, on the second and third motions, I'd slightly change the language if that's not going to work in any way, shape, or form. Let me know, but it really doesn't read well um, in terms of the select board. I move that the select board, I mean, that's the way a typical motion is, so I have to strike out the we. Yeah. Or that the select board pursuant to that? I oh, move I that see. the select board pursuant to the authority. Okay, well, it, I think it'll fly. Yeah. But if not, you can, we can redo it. We've done that before tonight. I have one other thing before we move it. We got a new sheet tonight on um, five on Sunrise, which I frankly didn't even know existed until I didn't this town either. meeting. Um, but it's, it's got some really cool measurements on it, but I have no idea what they really mean. Mm -hmm. So just, I'm assuming that's already been updated on the packet too, because it was on the back of this thing, but now it's a new one. Oh, it's got degrees. It. Put in your little, put in your GPS system. Yeah, <laughs> so you can find sunrise. Go look for it. Yeah, so I, I, I go on that there. street all the time. And I said last night, I don't recall sunrise. <laughs> I checked it out before the warrant review, so I would know what I was talking about. Sure. I had never noticed yeah. it either. Okay. On the new, as you go down the newly repaved South Whitney. <laughs> That's oh, right. yes. I love <clears throat> the street. Uh, <laughs> South Whitney, I mean. It's sunrise I couldn't find in my head. Shall I move? Please. I move that the select board recommend to the April 30th, 2012 annual town meeting, Article 5, Street Acceptance, Sunrise Avenue. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. 
I move that the select board pursuant to the authority granted under GL chapter 82 sections 21 to 24 hereby lay out Sunrise Avenue as a public way which layout is shown on a plan of land entitled Sunrise Avenue Street Acceptance dated April 30th, 2012, prepared by the Amherst Department of Public Works Engineering Department and adopt the order of layout, therefore, and further direct said order and plan be sent to the town clerk for filing. And just Second. a note, that's April 23rd. Say April 23rd, but right. What did I say, August? 30th, but that's okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I was looking right at 23. <clears throat> Don't Not know a problem. how that happened. Uh, has that been seconded? Second. And further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Actually, I do know how it happened. I, my tongue has been saying April 30th for every single for the, article. Yeah. Oh, right. So we <laughs> just wanted that configuration. Yeah. Yes. Brainwashed. All right. I move that the select board, pursuant to the authority granted under general law, chapter 82, sections 21 to 24, hereby alter the layout of University Drive as a public way which altered layout is shown on a plan of land entitled right of way property plan university drive route nine to big y amherst mass ma rather prepared by stantec consulting services incorporated northampton ma and adopt the order of alteration of layout therefore and further direct that said order and plan be sent to the town clerk for filing Second. Further discussion, Mr. Hayden. I think I'm going to miss this one. I, I think I've seen a version of this article since I started with the select board four years ago. <laughs> you this is the last all over one, right? Again. That's right. <laughs> all in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay. So, Mr. Hayden, I believe you were doing University Drive. Would you like to do Sunrise also? Sure. I can send you the little bit of notes that I have about that. Okay, we are officially done with the warrant articles except for Article 29, which we will uh, hopefully complete. We'll at least take up again on, on next Monday at the middle school. That is the secure communities one for which we are waiting for more information. Okay, town manager's report. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, briefly recap uh, how I spent my Friday night, uh, last Friday night. Uh, I had the... Uh, pleasure uh, of doing a ride-along uh, with the Amherst police as a guest. <laughs> uh, now? Not, uh, not in the back of the car. I went out with uh, <laughs> uh, the lieutenant in charge of, of the uh, late shift, uh, Jerry Miller, uh, last Friday night between about uh, 10 o'clock and, and 1.30 in the morning. and. Uh, we talked earlier tonight about Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods Initiative and the uh, enforcement piece and the outreach uh, to the community uh, is part of what we think is a proactive effort to uh, allow uh, young people in particular to enjoy the warmer weather but do so in a, in a uh, uh, responsible way that's respectful of uh, community uh, standards. Um, um, I have to say that uh, how impressed I was with the, uh, all of the men and women in the police department in Amherst, their thoroughness, their teamwork, and the professionalism that I witnessed. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Miller, not surprisingly to me, but I wanted to put out there on the public record, he's a class act and a real asset to the town and to the department. And he demonstrated uh, his leadership skills to the other members uh, uh, in the police department, letting officers on a scene make decisions for themselves uh, with appropriate uh, support and guidance from him along the way. Uh, the uh, focus of our police work, although the uh, enforcement actions get a lot of uh, media attention, uh, as they should. Um, but the vast majority of police work, whether it's on a patrol on a Friday night in the springtime or other parts of the year, uh, is really a focus on prevention and nipping potentially bad things from happening in the bud. 
Um, and so Friday night that was manifested uh, with uh, extra, extra patrols. Uh, there were bike patrols. Uh, there was coordination, collaboration with the UMass Police, Mass State Police, uh, property managers, including some private security details in places like Townhouse that all contributed uh, to making it a safer environment. Uh, outside of that, we have the ongoing work of the Campus and Community Coalition to reduce high-risk drinking, uh, our inspection services team, landlords, et cetera. Uh, in terms of uh, staffing levels and calls for services uh, this past weekend, the good news is that there's no major banner headline, uh, but that should be news in, its, in of itself, that it was a relatively uh, quiet weekend, uh, particularly for this time of year. Uh, starting on Friday afternoon where we had a real nice day, uh, Puffer's Pond, uh, we had both a staff and a uh, police presence uh, in the afternoon, uh, some dialogue with uh, people coming onto the uh, beach, uh, reminding them uh, very clearly about our open container bylaw and that alcohol was uh, strictly forbidden at Puffer's Pond, and uh, we didn't have any problems. And that's a good thing. I also want to acknowledge that uh, the UMass police assisted us last Friday by having an officer uh, at the pond for part of the afternoon. And that's uh, greatly appreciated as we try to work more closely together going forward. Uh, we had uh, uh, regular patrols augmented with a state alcohol uh, enforcement grant that funded some overtime for additional police coverage. Uh, we had approximately uh, 14 officers on duty Friday night from 7 p.m. to 3 a.m. Saturday, we had as many as 40 officers on duty uh, in the midnight uh, time frame, um, and about 30 on duty after 2 o'clock or so Saturday afternoon. Over the weekend, we had 256 calls for service, which sounds like a lot, but a it's not atypical for late April weekends to be in excess of 300 calls. Uh, we had 34 arrests, down substantially from some comparable numbers in previous springs. Uh, we had uh, 26 physical custodies, mostly for alcohol and noise-related issues. Only 18 noise-related calls, and that compares with twice that many on the Patriots Day weekend last week. On the fire EMS side, we had a steady number of calls, but uh, uh, not a crazy number, quote unquote. Talking to uh, uh, Chief Nelson, uh, we had 43 emergency runs over the weekend, 12 that are fire related, 31 ambulance related, and there was no need at any time over the weekend to call in any mutual aid ambulances. Um, so over the course of uh, Friday evening when I was out, uh, participated in a roll call, participated uh, in just observing uh, responses to a handful of motor vehicle accidents, and then routine patrolling uh, all over town, but in particular some of the apartment complexes in North Amherst, uh, Hobart Lane, Townhouse, Puffton, uh, uh, Gatehouse Road, Colonial Village, and uh, the level of activity there was relatively quiet no large, uh, uh, super large gatherings of uh, parties. Uh, we did have some calls for service for uh, house parties on Main Street, Lower Main and College Street, as well as uh, McClure Street that officers uh, monitored and responded to. And those were, were uh, brought under control with the cooperation of the uh, tenants and guests who were attending. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that uh, and thank again the, the, all the men and women of our police as well as our fire EMS for doing uh, nice work. And it's news when there's no news. And I also salute the young people for uh, taking to heart the vast majority of them, the many messages being sent out by uh, campus leaders, student leaders, and our, our law enforcement people too. Uh, have fun, but be safe and be respectful to the neighborhood they live in.
Thank you very much. Okay. Questions or comments for Mr. Musanti? I will note that uh, I, have a, I have a portable scanner that I got years ago when I was doing a website writing about town stuff, and uh, so I turned it on for some interesting evenings. And uh, of course, I had to listen when I knew that Mr. Musanti was out on patrol, <laughs> see what he was hearing, and, uh, and also on Saturday to see what things were like. And I was really struck by the fact that while things were very busy, what I kept hearing was that the uh, that the the parties or the places that the police were responding to that the folks were cooperative. That was that was a recurring theme was a cooperative and uh, and I think that's terrific. That's just really kind of showing um, mutual respect for everybody. It, it, we've talked about it in a bunch of different ways tonight. The need to strike a balance and we're just trying to strike right. a balance between. Um, quality of life for people who aren't celebrating the end of finals and the end of their school year and those who are and because uh, we're all we're all living here together and we're all appreciating this magnificent college town and we just have to make sure that we're striking the right balance of respect so uh, I think it's great that you did that I also want to mention that for folks who don't know um, Mr. Musanti has joined the world of Twitter and he uh, in fact tweeted about his ride along on Saturday and uh, folks who are Likewise, in the Twitter world, can follow him and interesting town news at uh, Amherst Musanti. So, all right. Uh, anything else? No, I was going to mention that. that oh, believe I it or not, <laughs> the town manager is now on Twitter. And, uh, <laughs> What's that? Uh, live to tell about it so far. I'm happy to be doing it. It's another way to try to communicate with uh, all of the townspeople and, and get feedback. So, I'm looking forward to uh, being active on that. and. Full steam ahead. Thank you very much. You'll never mass. Uh, you'll never meet the prolific tweeting of Mr. Wald. No, who, I won't. Uh, <laughs> I think he must actually get paid for this because he's he's just unbelievable. Sort of per tweet. That's right. <laughs> We're all trying to learn from Mr. Wald. Anything else, Mr. Misanti? Uh, no, just that I'm looking forward to uh, the inauguration of the New Hampshire College president. Uh, Jonathan Lash this coming Friday. Thank you. All right, member reports. Anybody? We just met five days ago. So yeah, we just <laughs> met. <laughs> but if any, what do you want? Ms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Brewer. <laughs> if anybody still has time, tomorrow night, uh, 6 to 7.30 in the Campus Center Reading Room is the Hunger Banquet, uh, <laughs> umasshungerbanquet at gmail.com. They did invite us. Um, I'm not sure uh, how many tickets they've sold. I'm sure they still have some available. I'm going to be speaking at 645 briefly, and then someone who I don't think I know from the Survival Center is going to be speaking as well. So, And it sounds like they've got the program lined up pretty tightly, which sounds fun. So, Great. Thank you for doing that, and thank you for to that group for inviting us. We were also invited nice. to an event tonight that unfortunately yeah. we're here and we couldn't be at. Um, a really wonderful Earth Day event that Robert Kennedy Jr. was gonna, going to yes. be speaking at and the Student Government Association and others were putting this on and, uh, and we are all very sorry we couldn't attend that because I'm sure that was gonna be a fantastic event. But uh, we appreciate how much um, different student groups have been reaching out to the select board and really trying to get uh, the town involved with what they're doing. Okay, no other member reports at this time? All right, um, just I think one more thing then before we go. I just want to talk quickly about expectations for town meeting, um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page about stuff. Um, so typically what we do is we meet on before the Monday session of town meeting and we at that point either plan to meet or not meet on Wednesday and then confirm that kind of after the Monday night town meeting session to, in case anything has come up that we know that we uh, then need to meet for that Wednesday. Um, so are we good continuing that, basically planning on the Mondays and, and the Wednesdays will play by ear as they yep. come up? Okay. Um, another thing uh, is that we have, the, we've been doing this for several years, uh, I can't remember if it predates the select board or not, um, at not taking public comment when we're at the middle school because we have such a short period of time to be there. So if folks do need to address something with us, they should let us know and we will schedule it if it is time sensitive. Uh, otherwise, we will not be doing public comment at the middle school per usual. Um, we will try and end our meetings by 7.20. We have made a real effort in the last couple of years to 
to make sure that we're in there and ready to start town meeting on time so that, God forbid, they're not waiting for us. That always looks <laughs> terrible. <laughs> so we will try to keep doing that. Um, I'll remind so select board that when we speak to these different articles, um, it works very well to just say, for all the reasons already stated, <laughs> unless yes. we're the prime presenter of an article, right. but uh, but we really don't need to feel like we need to reinvent the wheel or whatever. Sometimes we have new information to right. add, but we don't need to feel pressured. And I commend the select board for, I think we started it a couple of years ago, staying at our seat and not yeah. necessarily going up to the podium if we don't need to, especially if we're just going to say, for all the reasons already right. stated, it's little things like that that save time. Um, let's see. Uh, in looking at the different article assignments, we should make sure that if we are not speaking to an article that we have notes on, it's a recurring one, or otherwise we know about it, we should get those notes to the person who is speaking to it. So uh, so everyone, please take a look at those things. Um, just a couple other scheduling things, just to let you know, next Monday's select board meeting will have uh, a third quarter budget update. That would have happened tonight, except that it needed to be postponed because... Uh, because of vacations, so we will have that at the middle school next week. We will also have the Kendrick Park Farmers Market coming to us to make a little commercial for their market, which starts uh, in just a couple of weeks, and they'll be asking us for parking. Um, and then we will be talking about Article 29 and trying to finish up our position on that. Um, on the following Monday, the 7th, we have another liquor license hearing. It is for Amherst Brewing Company. This is one of those technicalities, another change of stock thing, but uh, we had to schedule it. So just so we know, that is uh, first thing on Monday, the 7th. Um, I believe we're also going to have a Western Mass Electric a poll hearing that night. We're still looking into whether this is nice and easy and can be done quickly, and if so, then uh, then we'll be all set for the 7th, and if not, then we might need to reschedule it. One thing that I need to ask you if you're willing to schedule possibly for Wednesday the 9th is um, we have an application in from the Hess gas station in South Amherst that needs a public hearing for fuel storage. They're increasing the amount of fuel that they want to want or need to be able to store on site, and that actually requires a butter notification and blah blah blah. Um, I, Ms. Brewer might have dealt with this years ago. Otherwise, it was before her time on Select Board. But this this came before Select Board, not not at Hess, but a fuel storage issue on Pine Street yeah, um, a number of years time, ago. Yeah. I remember watching that. But uh, so none of us have dealt with that yet. I don't really know what to expect as far as a butter concerns or anything so I don't want to schedule it as though it's a 10 minute thing when maybe it's a 40 minute thing so would we and and it does require advance notice for for the posting and a butter notification um, would we be willing to do that on Wednesday the 9th sure. I just think sure. it's kind of the safest way to schedule that okay thank you very I mean, much worst comes to worst we could postpone the rest of it right we could we could right we move wouldn't have to close it's going to be taking two hearing. hours correct yeah. correct right we wouldn't have to give it short shrift for <clears> sure but we could continue the hearing continue, continue hearing it. right can Ms. Brewer. i remember when we went around before we realized that the stuff at commonwealth college at umass actually was going to be done at the state level and we didn't need to be worried about it could we see if town council has anything about this from their other communities because yeah it's not and it was it was messy last time, and it was propane for condos as opposed to, you know, a gas station being a bigger gas station. So it was a lot different situation. Right, right. So it's a new learning opportunity for us, and we'll try okay. and have as much <laughs> advanced information about that as we possibly can. All right. I think that is all of the things I needed to mention to you folks. Does anybody see anything that I'm missing from the motion sheet or the agenda? Okay, uh, let's see, anything else we need to mention then? Announcements? Other? All right, then Mr. Hayden. I would notice that the adjournment is not on <laughs> the agenda, but I would move to adjourn. <laughs> then, without objection, this meeting adjourns at 8.57 p.m., and we will see you all at the middle school next Monday. Yay. Thank you very much.